Good evening. I'm Vita Palladino, the director of the Howard Gottlieb Archival Research Center. I'm very glad that you're here tonight on this winter night. I welcome you. This is our Ready to Vote program where we are trying to encourage students to register to vote, to vote, and to become informed on issues that are relevant in this presidential election. We're very lucky tonight that we are going to have a reading by the students from the College of, I'm sorry, the School of Theater in the College of Fine Arts, uh, of our collectee in the center, whose papers we have, William Master Simone, of his play called The Afghan Women. We are very honored that he came from Pennsylvania to be here tonight for this reading. And Mr. Master Simone is an Emmy-winning, prize-winning playwright and TV writer who writes about serious issues. He's somebody who tries to make us think. That's why we like him. We want people like this. And he brought with him a very distinguished gentleman, Dr. Abdullah Osman, Director of Operations in Afghanistan for International Orphan Care, a nonprofit organization offering educational programs, skills training, guidance counseling, nutrition, and foster care for families and to children in Afghanistan. He's a very dedicated man to the healing process in Afghanistan. Following this reading, there will be a panel discussion and you'll be able to ask questions of our panelists. And we hope that the actors will actually participate. I would like to introduce the cast. And I'm going to do it in the order as they're going to sit. Danielle Pardue. You can go up. Nicholas Wakefield. Tim Spears. Emily K. Liberis, Hannah Husband, Megan Dalton, and Michelle Poynton. And I would also like to acknowledge our student director, would you please stand, Bridget Catherine O'Leary. There will be a 10 minute in intermission between acts one and two. I will now turn this over to our actors. Thank you very much. The Afghan Women, Act One. Lights up on an empty stage strewn with human bones. Dawn. Enter the Afghan women pulling the cart. They gather the bones by the light of oil lamps. Shoulder blade. Thin. Kneecap. Not worth the trouble. Breastbone? Not bad. In this light, I can't tell a landmine from a mandible. A mandible doesn't explode when you pick it up. Speak evil, and it happens. Tibia. Pathetic. Clavicle. Not much to it. Skullcap. Child's. Child's femur. Child's rib. Child's vertebrae. Child's sternum. We stand on a mass grave of children. Better than nothing? There's no harvest here. Let's be satisfied with the bones we have and find refuge from the cold. My knees kill me with every step, but a half full cart won't fetch enough bread for a day. My shoulder throbs with vengeance, but I say we get what we can get. Up in the mountains, bones are heaped in mounds just under the melting snows. Men's bones, big, thick men's bones, Bones picked clean by the fat crows of Afghanistan. Bones good and white, strewn on the ground in neat clumps that make an easy harvest. What? Pull the cart up a mountain road, a mountain road full of bomb craters. The road that would make a strong horse stumble and huff? We pull it empty up, we pull it full down. Bandits behind every rock. Landmines everywhere underfoot. We always manage. Inshallah. God willing, if we must bend our backs, let it be worth the pain. A man. As per custom, the Afghan women cover their faces at the approach of a man. God deliver us from violent men. God deliver grave robbers to everlasting fire. We are no virgins to bloodshed. We butchered a man twice your size. Malale throws down her shovel, aims her Kalashnikov. Salam! In the name of the Holy Prophet, spare us. Back off. Back off. 
What are you doing here? Harvesting bones. This is a graveyard. What better place to gather bones? All of Afghanistan is a graveyard. Some lie below the earth. Some walk above. We are the unfortunate living dead. Grave robbers. May your bones burn in hellfire, turn to ash, scatter in the wind as meaningless dust. What do you think we are? We never dig up bones. What's that in your cart? We only harvest what bones God exposes by wind or rain. Wild dogs, not God, raise the bones from their earthen beds. And these are children, not ears of corn to be harvested. They only knew peace in their mother's wombs. Is peace in Afghanistan denied even in the graveyard? Have you lost all human feeling? What need have you with bones of children? The bone monger in Jalalabad pays us by the cartload. They cut and polish bones into buttons. Buttons for dresses, buttons for shirts. Little bones they grind into chicken feet. No bone monger would buy these child's ribs for buttons. You get more buttons from men's bones, more bulk. That child died of starvation, and you would pulverize his remains so a chicken may eat. Back off! Back off this sacred ground. Put the bones back. Back off. Put my children back where I laid them. Dogs, less than dogs. How can you deny us but dust and ashes? A cartload of bones buys us enough non for another day. Why waste the fruit of Move war? on, move on. The dead are kinder than the living. They give freely what they have no use for. The child spirit that once shed this bone now sups in paradise. But we who are left behind to roam a barren land for sustenance. You wrong us to call us less than dogs. Not knowing we once lived proud lives in a village that is no more. Proud as a dog of the bone it snatches from another dog. Move on, or lie with the dead. What are you? You're not a man at all. All men have a Kalishnikov. I have a Kalishnikov. Therefore, I'm a man. Why do you disguise your womanhood? What else should I feign when a man with a Kalishnikov is law of the land? Thugs think twice at the sight of it. But your Kalishnikov is bent. <laughs> No bullets, either. <laughs> <laughs> and she made us tremble and pray. All for show. My trouble is not for show. Take advantage of my sex at your peril. I've crushed the skulls of wild dogs with this very shovel. Malale sits, removes bloody bandages from her hands, pulls two strips of cloth from her coat, bandages her bleeding hands. Your accent. American. American? Born here, raised there. I am Gulale. Nahid. Wajma. Malale. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Is it true that everyone in America is rich? Yes, but they don't know it. Is it true women work and men stay home and take care for, of babies? Don't believe everything you hear. Is it true that there are ovens that cook a meal in minutes? Microwave ovens, yes. Even the name sounds evil. It makes life easy. Minutes, not hours? Minutes. I had one in my kitchen. How long does it take to cook a leg of lamb in a microwave? Wave. Ten minutes. Just to go gather wood for the oven takes half a day. Another hour to butcher the lamb. Another hour to bank the fire. Another hour to chop spices. Another to trim and dress the meat. Turning the meat again and again so it doesn't dry out. Cooking alone takes four hours. In the microwave, ten minutes. Go on. No, really. First they walk on the moon, now this. W what does it look like, this micro thing? Well, it's a metal box with a door, a bunch of push buttons. What are the buttons for? Well, some buttons have numbers to set the time, the other buttons for the kind of meat you're cooking. What? You can push a button f for any meat you want? Of course. If you want chicken, you push the chicken button. There's beef, lamb, goat, <laughs> and then the chosen meat appears in the oven. God be praised! Then you push a button for spices, garlic, rosemary, whatever your taste, and these appear in the oven. Clearly this micro thing is of the devil. Then you push another button for tomatoes, rice, vegetables, fresh hot naan. Can you push these buttons every day? You can push another button for mast, fresh strawberries and cream, tea with, with mint and lots of sugar. But where does the food come from? When the meal is done, the microwave washes up the dishes and plays a lullaby and sings you to sleep. Push another button for true love, happiness, and redemption. <laughs> <laughs> there is no such oven. Not in this life. What did you speak true? Ten minutes is true. But in truth, the leg of lamb would be more succulent cooked on a wood fire. Why do your hands bleed? Digging graves. For children? Orphans. That sad pile of bricks is the orphanage. What do they die of? Starvation, landmines, disease. Sometimes I think of a broken heart. 
You dig one, two, sometimes three graves a day. The stones come alive. The stones rise up from deep within the earth to thwart my shovel. The stones say no. My shovel says yes. Every day is a war against the stones. My shovel is bent, my body bruised, my bone joints jarred. I fall asleep exhausted. And then the wild dogs come down from the mountain after dark. They dig under the stone mounds I pile on each grave. They dig till their paws run with blood to taste the cold flesh of the young. Some have tasted my flesh. She lifts her pant leg to show the dog bites. They left their teeth marks on my legs, but my blood was the last blood they tasted before I crushed their skulls. May we take refuge in your, in your orphanage tonight? No. You don't understand our customs. You cannot turn anyone away. Even in the meanest hovel. Even in a cave. Even in a refugee camp. Hospitality is an obligation here. My only obligation is to my children. Can we not at least sleep under your roof? Walls gape from a rocket attack, inviting the snow and rain. The stabbing wind off the Hindu Kush whistles through the bullet holes in the windows. There is neither warmth nor peace inside. Seek refuge some other place. We'd feel safer amongst others. We must take what the rough road gives us. We must take what the prejudiced sky gives us. Today, God gives us you. I don't know what infections you might give the children. You are just another scourge upon Afghanistan. Then flee from the scourge. You are a hard woman. My life is a child exploded by a landmine. And there's no morphine. I raise my voice to God that the children stop dying long enough for my bleeding blisters to heal. And you call me a hard woman. I pray that God makes me more rock than all the Hindu Kush. Seek shelter in a refugee camp. Refugee camps are living graveyards. Then you should feel at home. Every day is a jihad just to breathe the air. Every day is Ramadan. A forced fast. Or a bitter banquet of foul grasses. Say goodbye to dignity. The men are not men. They soak and stare at mountains where they once dwelt. They turn away their eyes in shame. But the women? Another story. The women carry on. The women always carry on. They had little before, they have nothing now. They fetch the water in bent up cans. They collect and dry dung for fires. Without complaint. That's what their lives were before. That's what their lives are now. They keep their hovels clean. They make brooms out of bundled field grass tied to a stick. And sweep the ground clean. They move like half ghosts between this world and the next. They know how to submit to forces larger than themselves. How to bend like grass in the wind. How to disappear to the critical eye and still be there. How to lead when men are weak. How to surrender when men are strong. There you hear miles and miles of baby cries. Crying. Crying. For the milk turned sour in the young breast. Crying. crying. For the razor wind off the Hindu Kush. Crying. crying. For other babies crying. 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 Mothers begin crying. Crying for babies not their own. Crying, crying. like evil music all, all night. Day. All night. They know their baby is next. For they know the heartbreak of laying a child in a cold grave. And the road is not much better. The blast of wind off the Hindu Kush is kinder. A woman alone is fair game on the road. Once we had men to protect us. But one day, a man, a, a warlord, came to our village. Behind him, an army of savage students with Kalishnikovs. The warlord ordered every man, woman, and child out of their homes. He said all men must fight with the savage students against foreigners. Rashid, my husband, stepped forward, spit on the ground, looked the savage students in the face, and said no. My sons, Hezekiah, Samir, Chaden, and Bilal said no. My husband, Timur, my sons, Khalik, Nadir, and Arif said no. My sons, Ghazi, Zilmai, and Fakur, my brother, Hassan, said no. Savage students bound their arms with their own turbans. Marched the resistors into the barren hills. Forced them to kneel. Nahid acts out the execution, going to her knees, hands behind her back. And in mid-prayer. Beard and beardless. Despite our begging cries. They put muzzles to the back of their heads. A salvo echoes as in a distant valley, as in a dream. Martyrs all. Regaled in paradise. Savage students carried off our possessions. Raised our mud houses. We scattered like Bugs when a stone is overturned, leaving the bodies of our men. Don't say it. Don't you dare say it. Leaving the bodies of our beloved unburied, without the proper Muslim rights. Food for crows and dogs. 
The Afghan women react to the pain, hitting themselves, wailing, tearing their clothes, pulling their hair, beating their chests with fists. What happens on Judgment Day? When angels sound trumpets and call for body and soul to reunite. What resurrection can there be for our men? When their souls lack bodies. And we with bodies lack souls. Wandering from bone heap to battlefield. Fields that once swayed with wheat, now barren. When I was a girl, from here to those mountains, grew green with grapevines. Vines as thick as my arm. Vines bending with the weight of yellow grapes. Fruit so sweet, it had to be a gift from God. The taste still lingers in my mouth. Vines the savage students cut. Rooted out and burned for firewood. Hundreds of years of sweet yellow grapes. Now a wasteland not fit for weeds. Full of rusted engines of war. Landmines everywhere. Alive with dust devils. Sun-seared land turned to dust. Once fecund soil is now powder. Powder swept up by wanton winds across Afghanistan. Punishing anything with eyes. Clouds give not a drop of rain to relieve our desolation. Now the farmers are fled or dead. All their knowledge of the land in the grave with them. Now the land gives a crop of bones. We harvest the crop and thank God. Oh, thank God for war. Who won the war? We can only find those who lost. We are but grains of wheat between millstones. Crushed to nameless dust. Have we sinned? What is our sin? What ugly sin would merit this punishment? If this is our just punishment, when will it end? Why has God abandoned us? We used to recite the 99 beautiful names of God. But does God hear us? Does God see us forcing boiled grass into our stomachs? We wander the fields like beasts of burden. Pulling our bone cart. Abandoned children listening for their father's footfalls. Where, Where are, are you? you? We hear the faint sound of children singing in the orphanage. Against my better judgment, you are welcome inside for a cup of rice and tea. But should you desecrate this ground again, I will fracture every bone in your bodies and leave you for the wild dogs. Exit Malale. The Afghan women pick up their knives. That woman will not last long in Afghanistan. Well, what is it? The cold road or the orphanage for rice and tea? I saw something in her eye that I fear. Reckless. Brazen. Proud. Mad. mad. She just might serve us tea and bash our skulls in with her shovel. The cloud that thunders does not bring rain. But she did give in to us. Free vinegar is always sweeter than honey. But she might be an evil gin luring us to some gruesome end. I say no. My aching back says yes. She's one. We're three. We never turn our backs on her. Then it's rice and tea in the orphanage. One hand for the tea glass, the other tight around the grips of our knives. As the Afghan women exit, they turn the cart, converting it to a makeshift operating table, leaving their oil lamps behind. Lights change. We are now inside the orphanage. The cart is a makeshift operating table. On it, a child's corpse covered in a caftan, white burial cloth. One of the child's legs is amputated at the knee. The amputated leg lies on the caftan as well. On one end of the table, a stainless steel pan of surgical instruments covered with a clean white towel. Enter Malale. She lays out a prayer rug and prays in the Muslim fashion. Omar, look there. Rose, over here. Enter Omar. He looks around for danger, goes to the door, signals someone. Enter Hajigul Azrala Mahmud, blood on his clothes, with a Kalashnikov, ammo belt, and sidearm. Exit Omar. Who's in charge here? I am. Are you a man or a woman? Doesn't matter for the work I do. Who, may I ask, are you? Even the birds in the trees know my name. I want to deal with a man. You'll find the grave of the former administrator out back. If you find him unhelpful, perhaps you can deal with me. What is your name? Superintendent of the orphanage. Oh, you have a mouth, don't you? The one God gave me. You look Afghan, but your accent gives you away. You're American. I'm both. Do you know about the, terrible, about the troubles in Kabul? I've heard nothing about troubles. Subversives tried to overthrow the government. God was with the government troops, but the subversives have ambushed us at the mountain pass. Many of my fighters have been killed and wounded. I am honor bound to protect you and the children, but I think the most prudent course would be to evacuate the children to the tribal territory, but 20 miles due east and wait for government troops. Praise God, there are noble men such as yourself who put the safety of children above their own. 
We, can, we count you among our scant blessings, but we have braved worse. My children will remain here. Your children? You are not their milk mother. I'm the mother God gave them. These children might be caught in a deadly crossfire between my fighters and the bandits. Then the best thing you can do for the children is to remove yourself from the orphanage and prevent a deadly crossfire. Mahmoud looks at the dead child, lifts the white towel covering the stainless steel pan. Don't touch that, please. Surgical instruments. They're sterilized. Is there a doctor here? Standing before you. A doctor with a Kalishnikov. A broken Kalishnikov. Are you bleeding? It's not my blood. Enter Omar. Sadiq and his kinsmen deserted. Rope breaks are the weakest part. Pursue them? We're stronger without faint hearts. Place kinmen on, kinsmen on every room, every, uh, on the roof and at every door. Shoot anyone who leaves. Anyone. Where are your stores of food? We have nothing. Look for food. Pardon me. Walk on the paths lined with white stones outside. Butterfly landmines are everywhere. Tashakur. Exit Omar. Mahmoud picks up a burqa. Your burqa? It belongs to one of the teachers. Your hands, what happened? Digging graves. These hands were not made for shovels. Man's work has scratched away your painted fingernails. Are there no men to do that kind of work? Usually the pharmacist, pharmacist shares the digging with me, but he's been gone for days. Gone where? Over the mountain to bring back rice from a refugee camp. In a blue Toyota? How would you know that? We saw a blue Toyota at the pass, riddled with bullets, burning on the side of the road. Bandits. I'm sorry to say the driver was dead. We buried him by the side of the road with all Muslim rights. Tasha Kaur, thank you. Who put a foreigner in charge of Afghan children? Your government. I'm a volunteer. What government? Those puppets in Kabul? That gatherings of weaklings? Not my government. Your parents, both Afghan? My mother's American. My father was born here. What's he do? He was a professor at Kabul University. Oh, a necktie. What is your father's tribe? My father is an Afghan. Afghan is not a tribe. My father would just say Afghan. A Kabul intellectual. My father was born on a mountaintop. What mountain? A mountain of the Hindu Kush in Afghanistan. Who is your father is the most important question in Afghanistan. My father was Abu Tumor. His father, Wali Zahir. His, Ghazi Ghaffar. His, Mamun Samir. I can name my ancestors back a thousand years. And you? How many generations can you count? You're a leaf in a whirlwind without branch or root. It's difficult to believe you're even half Afghan. All Afghans, even those from lowly tribes, hold hospitality sacred. Here I am standing for so long with dust of the road in my throat and you haven't so much as invited me in for a glass of tea. We have no tea. No tea? No tea. No tea. We have nothing. What remarkable children live in this orphanage. <laughs> Their faces have smiles. They run and laugh. If one didn't know better, one would think they had food in their bellies. If there is no wind, the tree does not move. The goats give milk when in the mood. The chickens sometimes lay eggs. A drink of milk and eggs will tide the children over when the rice one runs out. A few prodigious pomegranate and pistachio trees and some date palms keep us in fruit. Your so-called Afghan father neglected to tell you we live by a code of honor. We are hard in battle, but hospitable at home. Come to my door. I will give you my last crust, even if you are my enemy and come to my door asking for sanctuary. It brings me great honor to give you protection. Your alleged Afghan father should have told you about revenge. Harm me and you will find no refuge on the earth. My kin are obliged to hunt you down. Have you heard about the Afghan who took revenge after a hundred years and said I acted quickly? Thank you for the lesson. Please excuse me. I must see that my children are well. You will stay in this room until we leave in the morning. You heard the order I gave. There's a Kalishnikov at every door and window. 
My fighters will make no exceptions. I must bury the child. My fighters will bury her. No hands but mine will bury Kalida. I demand to see my children. My fighters look after the children. If you touch those children, if you touch one of those children... What will you do? By what right do you now hold teachers and orphans hostage? How many Kalishnikovs do you command? I have more. And mine work. That is my right. Now do as I say and no one will be harmed. We leave before dawn. My men are tired and hungry and fear for their lives. Enter Omar. Roz demands to speak with you. Demands? He seeks permission to remove his kinsmen to the mountains. How do I answer him? Shoot him in the face. Shoot cousin Feroz? Your brothers would not have hesitated. Shoot him in the face and leave his corpse where it falls. What of his kinsmen? Kill one, frighten a thousand. Exit Omar. Mahmoud looks at the dead child. How did the child pass? She didn't survive the amputation. Did she suffer? Horribly. Rain falls on every roof. I am Jigul Azrala Mahmoud. Malale is my name. Amale. You give up your name as a modest woman gives up her treasure. How many hospitals and schools are named Malale? What a name. So much to live up to. I don't believe the legendary Malale ever existed. What do you say to that? She was real. I'll tell you why she never existed. What do the songs and old stories say? The British were winning some battle or other? Maiwand, 1880. And this Malale saw the Afghan warriors waver. Afghan warriors never waver. Supposedly, she rushed forward, waving her veil. Every female I ever knew ran away from the battle, not towards it. And supposedly, the Afghan warriors rallied and followed her to a great victory. Know why that is false? What man would follow a woman in battle? No man that I know. So much for Malale. A story for children. Is that why you do not cover your head? Because you think you are Malale, hero of my wand? I observe the veil when I'm in the street. Are you a believer? I was raised in both the Christian and Muslim faiths. Impossible! Then my parents did the impossible. They decided to get along. Either you believe Jesus is the son of God, or Muhammad is the last prophet. You cannot believe both. I was raised to believe that God is above the prophets, and that we were thrice blessed to have Abraham, Jesus, and Muhammad. Is it right for God to consort with women and have children? It is not for me to judge God. The holy prophet, blessed be his name, said, let Christians practice their own religion and Jews practice theirs. The devil can also quote the Quran. But the devil does not live by it. Gunshot off stage. Respect the customs of the country you are in. Cover your head in the presence of a man. Observe the veil now. Malale covers her head with a scarf. Mahmoud puts his Kalashnikov down. Your head is covered, but your impudent heart is shamelessly exposed. Enter Omar. He nods to Mahmoud that the order has been carried out. Continue to look for food. There are a few bony goats and some scruffy chickens. There's no other food here. There is food here. We looked in the classrooms, in the dormitory, in the kitchen. There is nowhere else to look. Omar, there is food here. The seeker is the finder. Exit Omar. Your father, how long has he been dead? My father still lives. Why did you think he was dead? No Afghan father would allow his daughter to turn out like this. My father is quite proud of me. Ah, of course. Even the porcupine says to its young, oh, my velvet child. <laughs> your father is not much of an Afghan. If you are an Afghan, you're quite correct. My father is not much of an Afghan. Careful. This is not America. The house you build too high is sure to fall. What did he teach your Afghan father? Ancient history. How did he meet your American mother? She was visiting Afghanistan. Nobody visits Afghanistan. Either they come as foreign agents to usurp us, or as, as dealers in opium. Which was your mother? An archaeologist. Come to rob our treasures. Come to find our treasures. Our treasures? I'm an Afghan. I was born here. Where? 
in a tent on an archaeological dig, beneath the colossal Buddha statues carved in the sandstone cliff of Bamiyan, now gone forever. My mother read me the history of Afghanistan in English. My father taught me to haggle in Dari and Pashtu for vegetables on Chicken Street in Kabul. If indeed you knew Kabul before the Great War, tell me what you saw in the street, and I will tell you if you speak true or not. On Chicken Street, you could get drunk from the flower stalls. Tulips were everywhere, blossoming trees on every corner. You'd turn a corner in Mondieri Bazaar, and the aroma of baking naan would capture you. Lamb and onion kebabs would make your mouth water. Vendors hawking chicken and copper pots and Kodak cameras. People haggled for mangoes and silk and blood oranges and handwoven carpets in Pashtu, in Persian and Urdu, in English. Women in the burqa, women without the burqa, women driving cars, girls on bicycles, women doctors, women professors. We had picnics on summer days in Pagman Gardens. I remember women in Western-style bathing suits there. The Kabul River flowed swiftly then. Nightingales woke you in the morning before the muezzin's call to prayer. We went to the cinema all the time. We saw John Wayne and Ingrid Bergman on the same day. We sat in tea houses where tea flowed from steaming brass samovars. We drank chai with sugar and fresh mint in glasses, or chai with cardamom in the exquisite pottery of East Alif, or Coca-Cola. Students discussed books. You couldn't turn a corner without bumping into a bookseller's. A young man would be playing a rebab, another reciting a poem to his bride, all dressed in white, surrounded by the wedding party. People told jokes. There was laughter. Music filled the air. People danced, men and women. Artists sold paintings in the street. Foreign cars and ox carts and tongas moved side by side. Pashtun faces, Tajik faces, Uzbek faces, Hazara faces. Nobody cared who you were then. God threw odds and ends in a basket and called it Kabul. You speak true. But still, you are not as Afghan as I am. And when the infidel invaded, the fact is, Mr. Born on the Mountaintop fled to safety with all the other intellectuals. My father raised money to pay for your bullets. As you are deep in his debt, the least you can do is not to malign his good name behind his back. Do you think I would bite my tongue if he were standing before me? Neither would he shrink unarmed, standing before a hundred thousand Kalishnikovs. But running to the other side of the world was easier than it was for us who stayed and fought to the end. I can count seven wounds. One in this leg, two in the other, two in my gut, one in my arm, one went in my mouth and passed through my cheek. See the scar? And one that took off a piece of that ear. Proof that God spared me seven times for some greater glory. That's when I made the Hajj to Mecca. He pulls a dagger from a sheath on the small of his back. At Tora Bora, hand to hand in the dark, Russian infidel aimed his Kalishnikov at me, pulled the trigger, jammed. More proof. I took the infidel by the throat, stuck the blade under his breastbone, bit off his nose, spit it back in his bloody face, and smiled as the light in his eyes set like the sun of an internal night. Take that story home to your supposed Afghan father. May I? He hands the dagger to her. You were looking at an heirloom has been handed down for a thousand years in my tribe. My great ancestor rode his horse into a wall of mogul bodyguards, slashing with his scimitar, and plucked this dagger from the side of the great Genghis Khan. Oh, really? Where have you ever seen a more beautiful thing? In the Kabul Museum. The Kabul Museum is a burnt-out shell. Yes, now. But it wasn't a burnt-out shell when I was six. I saw the same dagger in a glass case in the Kabul Museum when I was six. How could you possibly remember that? My mother and father lectured there. The museum was my childhood playground. Before the most vile of Afghans broke down the doors, escorting Peshawar antique dealers into the sacred hall of our history and pillaged our national treasure, as I would not expect a pig to appreciate a fine pearl, I would not expect a plunderer to marvel at the statues of King Kanishka, the bearded Hermes, the bust of the Hindu Shiva, the terracotta bodhisattva, the solid gold Buddha, the thousand-year-old ivory courtesans from India, ivory rendered more real than flesh. They packed their pickup trucks with Chinese lacquers, Roman bronzes, Alexandrian glass. 
They carried off Egyptian statuary, marble Hindu iconography. What was priceless was sold at a bargain, ended up on walls and in Tokyo, London, and coffee tables in New York, Kuwait, and Geneva to impress dinner party guests. The sacred load of our national soul reduced to conversation pieces, decor. What artifacts were too heavy to carry off were toppled and smashed. Exquisite pottery was used for target practice. All that remained of our past was the card catalog, and one cold night, the savage student guards dumped the card catalog in the middle of the museum floor and set it afire to warm their hands. What resided in that burnt out shell was our glory as Afghans. The memory of who we are, proof of our greatness, our struggles, our defeats, our triumphs. The link to our ancestors and those who plundered and possess our treasure are nothing less than murderers of the Afghan memory. Keep all those sublime museum treasures next to a cold bowl of rice and I know which one of your starving orphans would choose. Spirit without beauty or connection to the past is an emptiness far greater than a stomach without food. That's what I thought. Another intellectual with allegiance to some imaginary land in the clouds where there are no stomachs that ache for food? Like father, like daughter. Another intellectual now plays the hero and shows up after the tiger is dead. Do you know what the Russians did to my father in Polisharki prison? Under torture, he lost an eye the use of a hand, and most of his memory, and the ability to carry on the work he loved. So when you speak of my father, speak of the man who went to America with many other Afghans to petition not for daggers to stab Russians in the heart, but for stinger missiles. That's how the war was won. For all your faults, you prove your decency when you honor your father. My son Omar would not put up such a fight. Omar is your son? as vinegar is the son of wine. How did your father get out of Poli Charki? Prisoner exchange. When the Russians took him, my mother and I escaped to Pakistan. We walked by night and slept by day till we reached Peshawar. We lived there till he was released, then we all went to America. Malale returns to preparing the body for burial. Mahmoud helps Malale wrap the child in the caftan. She tears two strips of cloth from the end, hands one to him, he ties up one end, she the other. Who was she? Kalida. She stepped on a butterfly mine. How many times I have chided the children for wandering outside the safe path. I lined the path with parallel white stones. Whenever he went, we went out collecting dung for fuel, I had to keep looking out, looking over my shoulder at Kalida. She was a dreamer. She would sing back to the birds and chase butterflies. She refused to acknowledge the danger. I'd yell, Kalida, mind your feet, stay on the safe path. Children are always children. If I didn't amputate, she would die. If I did amputate, the risk of infection was great and I had no antibiotics. So I amputated. As if my knowledge, as if my skill, as if I could will her better. Drugs off the shelf from a corner apothecary back home could have saved my little dreamer. Not a leaf falls unless God wills it. This was her time. I assure you, Kalita will sleep in paradise tonight. The Quran promises those buried in clothes soaked with blood, whether martyred in battle or a woman giving birth, God shall welcome to paradise without account of deed. Tashakur. Why would you give up a good life in America for this shithole? The feet go where the heart goes. That's what your feet say. What excuse does your heart make? I was drawn here. Drawn by what? God knows. Malale also knows. I awoke one morning in God's open hand. Since that day, my life was not my own. I don't understand. Neither do I. You're not telling me everything. It's not your privilege to know everything. Having no tea is not your fault. Being uncivil is. One day, I read a verse of poetry. A verse written by an Afghan poet 800 years ago, and my former life ended and a new life began. Mahmoud makes himself more comfortable, removes his ammo belt. Which poet? Rumi. Rumi? Rumi? Rumi is not even Afghan. Rumi was born here. And like you, raised somewhere else where his brain was addled. Let me hear the verse that cleaved your life in two. It doesn't matter. Yes, I too would be ashamed of Rumi's verses. Ignorance is God's prison. Knowing is God's palace. 
That changed your life. Now I'm sorry I told you. You must forgive me. How did that change your life? I had a wonderful life in America. I had everything. But one day I saw my life with Rumi's eyes. I saw I was living in a prison of ignorance. I escaped. Escaped to this wonderful palace? Only a dreamer like Rumi could see a sewer and think at the Taj Mahal. No wonder. A selfless Sufi mystic. His poems are for women and monks in caves. Rumi is a shit shoveler compared to our poet, Kushal Khan Katak. My sword I girt upon my thigh to guard our nation's ancient fame. Its champion in this age am I, the Katak Khan Kushal's my name. Rumi cannot touch that. As Rumi would not touch steaming camel dung. <laughs> then let Rumi do battle with Kushan Khan Katak. Let's see who's superior, who is superior. Give me another Rumi, if you have one. I swear, since seeing your face, the whole world is fraud and fantasy. The garden is bewildered as to what is leaf or blossom. The distracted birds can't distinguish the bird seed from the snare. A house of love with no limits, a presence more beautiful than Venus or the moon, a beauty whose image fills the mirror of the heart. Simpering, sap-sucking Rumi. <laughs> you think Kushal Khan Katak has no softer strain? Think again. Sweet life that passes by, slowly, slowly. Like water, it flows slowly, slowly. Friends are the flowers of spring. They follow the path of autumn, slowly, slowly. Was that the verse, or were you clearing your throat? <laughs> Bring on another bucket of slop from Rumi's trough. Break the legs of what I want to happen. Humiliate my desire. Eat me like candy. It is spring, and finally, I have no will. Mystic Drivel, what does Rumi the eunuch know about women? Stand back, lest you be scorched by the heat of Kushal's fire. The greedy man eats sweet meats. The lover takes his queen's fair mouth. I'd always taste her sugary lips, though other men eat quails and manna. Both her breasts are round as pears, fit only for kings to taste. There is no bravery in him who will let the sword fall on his neck. The lover dies thus at your hands and still swears by his love for you. When does a hungry man pay heed to whether what he eats is lawful? Take her mouth, Gushal, in secret. The falcon steals flesh from the game. Where is Rumi's passion? What makes his cup overflow? These spiritual window shoppers who idly ask, how much is that? Oh, I'm just looking. They handle a hundred items and put them down, shadows with no capital. Hmm. What is spent is love and two eyes wet with weeping. But even if you don't know what you want, buy something to be part of the exchanging flow, start a huge foolish project like Noah, it makes absolutely no difference what people think of you. Not bad. For a Persian dog. <laughs> so this is your foolish project? You've come to build Noah's Ark? No. I came to reclaim the family estate, but there was nothing left of it. The house was bombed. The land filled with landmines. We decided to leave. We? Oui? My fiancé came with me. So you are married? No. We were on our way to the airport. Our taxi was blocked by a crowd in the street. A woman held a young boy in her arms. The boy was shrieking. He had picked up a butterfly mine. It blew off his fingers and part of his face. I made a tourniquet of my chadar. Five minutes sooner, I might have saved the boy's life. The boy looked up at me, sort of smiled. Tashakur. His eyes rolled back under his lids, and I knew it was the end of my life, too. Everything I thought I was, I wasn't. Everything I possessed was junk. My life before, people, books, movies, conversations, politics, silly. My ambitions, shallow. At that moment, I wanted nothing in the world but to bring that boy back to life. I decided to stay a while. 
Ethan went back to America. He was devastated. Back home, the wedding invitations had been sent. My wedding dress was hanging in the closet. Ethan said, you can't move a mountain with a teaspoon. But a mountain had to be moved. God handed me a teaspoon. What else could I do but yield to the madness? You must know it's impossible to change things here. A mere child moved my immovable life halfway around the world, so who can say what is possible and what is not? I can only marvel at your sublime innocence. Call it what you will. Your hand opens and closes and opens and closes. If it were always a fist or always stretched open, you would be paralyzed. Rumi? Enter Omar with the Afghan women. I found nothing but these beggars sleeping like dogs in a pile. Refugees from the cold, rough road. At your service, my Khan. Mahmoud gives coins for every compliment. May you flourish like a flower, but live longer, your eminence. All good things to Khan Mahmud, snow leopard of the Hindu Kush. Who but the holy priest himself, may his name be exalted in eternity, or your excellency, Amir Sahib Mahmud, would give ear to the homeless petitioners in a land where to breathe is to want. And to want is to never be satisfied. Where under the Afghan sky may three widows make their supplications, but in the presence of Haji Gul Azrala Mahmud. Let this suffice until a less troubled time when I may hear your worthy petitions with a lighter heart. Your generosity is like no other, Khan Mahmud. You are a, a mountain of a man, my, my emir. What business have you here? We come to thank Malalai for her generous hospitality. Generous hospitality? Oh. oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, great father, her generosity flows like the Atengaru waterfall in the Kabul River. You don't say. Oh, my Khan, the woman sated us with rice and tea. Rice and tea? <laughs> rice and tea. Rice and tea. Finding us cold and hungry, the good woman insisted on feeding us. Insisted? Which Malali are you talking about? Certainly not this Malali. This Malali does not insist upon hospitality. Fall from a mountain, you may walk again. Fall in a man's eyes, and you will never give up. I almost believed you. Nothing. Five fingers of the same hand are brothers, but not equals. These were your brothers. This is you. Puny, heartless, stupid. Bring me a child, I will get the truth. Leave the children out of this. Then where are your stores? You will find rice and tea in the dormitory, the last three beds opposite the window under the mattresses. Exit Omar. May every bite you take from a child's mouth turn to broken glass in your gut. Do you think you can shame me with your impunity? I could not shame you more than you shame yourself. These orphans have no chance to survive. The messenger, peace be upon him, was in himself an orphan and he survived. Muhammad, blessed be his name, was favored by God. Favored by God? and the compassion of his earthly uncle who raised him. Do you believe in the teachings of the Quran? One verse especially, have faith in God and tie your camel. <laughs> Otherwise, I am a tribesman first, Muslim second, Afghan third. And that is why Afghanistan is a land of warring tribes. Do you think we will go to bed tribesmen tonight and wake up Afghan in the morning? <laughs> After decades of warfare, most of the good men are dead. Now we have more women than men. Do you think we shall let women rule the country? Do you think a man like me shall let himself be ruled by a woman? To men like you, Afghanistan is a dead goat in the game of Buzkashi. She dresses like a man, now she thinks she is a man. When the horse was being shod, the frog put up its feet and cried, me too, me too. <laughs> Mahmoud begins to put his military gear back on. Your Afghanistan is desired by no one but a handful of warlords, a pack of goat grabbers, who keep us in a constant state of barbarism. What you call Afghanistan is only dirt and stone under my feet. Men like me, we are Afghanistan. What we believe, our code of honor, is Afghanistan. Our misery comes from outsiders like you who come to save us from ourselves. My Afghanistan is where my army stands. Where is your Afghanistan? With those imposters in Kabul who hide behind foreign troops? 
These foreign armies in Afghanistan, what do they want? They come to make us like them. We are not like them. We do not want to be like them. More invaders than you know have ventured here with the same air of superiority I see on your face. That is why it became our nature to make war. Darius, Alexander the Great, Kanashka, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, Tamerlan, Babur, mighty Britain, invaders defeated by men like me. Invaders who learn to pray like the Hindu, oh gods, deliver me from the venom of the cobra, the tooth of the tiger, the vengeance of the Afghan. Praise God that I was allowed to live in an age of heroes who made jihad against the great infidel. The greatest day of my life, O oh Malali, hero of my wand, was seeing those broken-spirited infidels, those lumps of men sitting on battered tanks, retreating north through the Solange. Pass after ten years, after jets and helicopters and tanks that could not defeat men like me. God keep Khan Mahmud. God gave Mahmud robust health. And all manner of blessings. History will recount your accomplishments and put them where they belong. In the Kabul Museum, among the artifacts of antiquity, a taxidermist will be called upon to encase you in glass. A brass plate will tell your story, the last warlord. <laughs> <laughs> you are a lost woman, Malali. No wonder your intended left you. No wonder you have to take care of other people's babies. A woman without babies doesn't know why she lives. It's why you're a miserable woman. You don't know your place. And what is my place? There are only two places for a woman. In the home or in the grave. Enter Omar. She told the truth. We found bags of rice disguised as bed mattresses in the dorm. What do I tell 157 children who will have no scoop of rice tonight? In a colony of ants, a droop, drop of dew is a flood. Can you not imagine your own children hungry and helpless? Can you imagine opening yourself up with a knife and tossing your heart, liver, and intestine in a dusty cobble street? Can you imagine how the world expects you to go on when you have lost your vital organs? Can you imagine feeling your flesh rot on your bones as you feel yourself pulled down into a vile black pit from which nothing returns? What can you know? No son ever forced his way out between your hips into the world with an eagerness to live and grow and ascend the mountain. Slaughter the goats. Slaughter those animals and it will be as if you turn your Kalishnikovs on the children. If my fighters don't eat, they will run amok. The Quran says, whosoever kills an innocent, innocent human being, it shall be as if he killed all mankind. Whosoever saves the life of one, it shall be as if he had saved the life of all mankind. Mm -hmm. I call upon you as a man of honor to spare the only food we have. Leave this place and do no harm to the children. My honor is taking care of my own. What crow would not agree with that? But crows are more honest. They don't call it honor. They know it's savagery. Move her aside. The Holy Prophet said, I and the person who looks after an orphan and provides for him will be in paradise. Move aside or I will order him to bash you with the rifle's butt. You may call yourself a man, but you offer little proof of it to the world. She provokes me. Lower your eyes. Bite your tongue. You are speaking to a hussy. If the donkey of Jesus goes to Mecca, it's still an ass. Mahmud slaps her, knocking her down. A crooked, a crooked mouth is set aright with a slap. Your so-called Afghan father should have told you an Afghan returns a punch for a pinch. Exit Omar. You have no idea who you're dealing with. We beg you, my Khan, have compassion for her Afghan side. She cannot help. She's half American. You want Afghanistan to be another star on the flag of America. You are just another invader. You have no gun. But I consider you more dangerous. I know how to deal with a man with a gun, but you, you bring ideas that explode like a car bomb. You think you bring us a wonderful gift? You call it freedom? Free from God, free from family, free from all restrictions. Is it freedom you want? Can you eat freedom? Can you wrap freedom around yourself on a cold and stormy night? Throws the burqa at her. 
Know your place. Don the burqa. Teach her the virtue of the burqa. When I return, she had better be in the burqa and show me proper respect. My fighters have wolves in their bellies. Prepare their food. It would be an honor to serve you, my Khan. Please me, and I will please you with any request within my power. You are too generous, my Khan. First deserve, then desire. You shall be satisfied, my Khan. May your house never fall down, great father. May you never know a day of sickness, our protector. May all your prayers be answered, our savior. If you would keep camels, make sure your door is big enough. Exit Mahmud. Wajma hands the burqa to Malale. Malale holds it. She throws it at the Afghan women. End of Act One. We'll take Act Two. Lights up quickly, a moment later. The Afghan women look at Malale's face. You got what you deserved. His compassionate blade allowed your nose to remain on your face. If you knew anything about Mahmud, you would kiss his hand. I know enough. Mahmud talks like a savior, acts like a bandit. He talks of his high deeds in the Great War, yet Hector's children with a swaggering display of arms and filters their last pala. He ordered his kinsmen shot in the face, then swoons to poetic verses. He loots the museum, then speaks of beauty. Disbelieve eyes and ears, and you will see Mahmoud has come for more than rice and tea. Automatic gunfire off stage. I smell blood. Not Khalida's. Not the blood of the goats just killed. Maybe my blood, maybe not. I know without knowing that death has come here. Mahmoud's son. Omar. I cannot leave this room, but you can. Find Omar. Offer him a blessing. Make small talk. Draw him out. His nature is simple. Discover Mahmud's purpose. What could the boy possibly know? The boot knows the stocking has a hole. I will do nothing against Mahmud. I would not think badly of Mahmud. Then bring Omar to me on some pretense. I will know the tree by the fruit that it bears. Mahmud was the warlord on the white horse we told you about. Mahmud led the savage students to our village. He watched as the savage students martyred our men. He slaughtered your men? And now you are fawning bootlicks? What else can women do? You insulted a great hero who led Mujahideen against the godless invader. Mahmud was the first among the warlords. But when the infidel was expelled, the warlords turned on each other. Mahmud and the savage students expelled the other warlords from Kabul. But the savage students turned on Mahmud. Mahmud retreated into the mountains. He rained rockets on Kabul for a year. Rockets by day and night. Rockets in the marketplace. Rockets on schools. Rockets on homes. Killing 50,000 Afghans. But Mahmud could not defeat the savage students. So he honored an old Afghan tradition. He joined them. Mahmud had no qualm for killing. 50,000 50, innocents. innocents. So why would he fret over you? Don the burqa and live to tell the story. If you haven't noticed, he's taken by you. Taken by your fire. Taken by your beauty. And you're taken by him too. How can you not be? Never think it escaped us. You are an unclimbed mountain to him. He cannot walk away from you. Because he needs to conquer you. So let him and let him think he did it all by himself. Give him less sheer of a cliff. More of a footpath to the top. Be overwhelmed at his greatness. Oh my Khan, you are too generous. Oh my Khan, you are a mountain of a man. A mountain of horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> Submit! Submit. A little. It won't kill you. Not wearing the burqa might. Don, Don the, the burqa. burqa. Better a bullet than a burqa. Women with such opinions lie putrefied in unmarked graves. Is that supposed to scare me? Don't tell me my face does not scare you. You stare at me when you think I'm not looking. My head was covered like a modest Afghan woman. Mahmoud's allies, the savage students, surrounded me in the Mandawi Bazaar, shouting, You should be a shining bride to your husband's eyes only. Maybe now you will observe the veil. And they flung acid in my face, melting my skin as flame liquefies wax. Maybe now you'll cover your face. That's what they shouted as my, fleece, my flesh sizzled like fat on a fire. My husband never touched me again. He took another wife and made me the servant. Next day, every woman at the market donned the burqa. That's Mahmud, the warlord you insulted. 
What true mother would not don the burqa to keep her children safe? And what do I teach them by that? You teach them how to keep alive in Afghanistan. You teach them when to keep their mouths shut. An education for sheep. Why are you here? For you or for them? Whose good comes first? I don't know. I wish I knew. I used to know. I'm so weary of being weary. Don the burqa. His heart would surrender to you. Then. Ah, uh, then. Then there's nothing he wouldn't do for you. Then the man will make the rivers flow backwards. Don, Don the, the burqa. burqa. The Afghan women help Malale put the burqa on. It's too tight around my head. That's the way it's supposed to be. But I can't breathe. You'll get used to it. I can't see through a spider web. Move around. Malale takes a few steps and trips. They help her to her feet. Malale starts to pull off the burqa. They stop her. The burqa has so much to offer. You don't fret about what to wear to market. Just throw it on over your shabbiest clothes. The burqa protects from the sun. The burqa protects you from men's lustful glances. Best of all, men can't see what you're thinking. Help me off with this thing. They killed you with cotton, not me. Malale throws off the burqa. Enter Omar. Mahmoud calls upon you to cook the meat. Exit the Afghan women. Stay a moment, please. A man and woman should never be alone. You have nothing to fear from me. It is not you I fear. Your arm. It looks infected. It's nothing. I'm a doctor. I will tell you if it's nothing. Let me have a look. If God doesn't heal it, what can a doctor do? Yes. Grandmother died, and then her fever ended. <laughs> it's only a burn. A third-degree burn. Badly infected. It does not hurt at all. Because the nerves have been destroyed along with all three layers of skin. She smells Omar's wound. Putrefication. What does that mean? Gangrene, amputation, meningitis, anaphylaxis, gingivitis. How long will it take? Less time than it takes to dig a grave. Omar sits immediately. Malale finds a bottle of green liquid and tends to his wound. Mahmoud requires me by his side at all times. I understand. I must not be long. I will hurry. If you had not warned me to stay between the white stones, I might have lost a foot or my life. I thank you. You are very kind. I have no antibiotics, but I have an herbal concoction that will cleanse the wound just as well. It stings a bit. So what news from Kabul? Very kind. Very, very kind. Very... Omar drifts off to sleep, sitting up. Malale just watches him. A moment later, he wakes with a start. How long have I slept? A few hours. What? Mahmoud left. To where? He needs some sleep. It takes one to know one. <laughs> uh, I cannot remember the last time I laughed. I'm happy to know we still can. Seems a laugh has given you a happy glow. Because I saw the one who is to be my bride. Sorry? <laughs> I only see her when I sleep, when I dream. But she has not come to me for a long while, but just now, when I closed my eyes, I saw her again. She's just a dream? But more real than you. How do you know she's to be your bride? By the way she looks at me. She looks at me and pulls back her veil. A virgin such as the Quran promises in paradise, a complexion like pearls, the scent of jasmine about her. Perhaps God has lifted the veil of the future to you. Do you think so? God knows our deepest desires. You are so fortunate. I will count myself fortunate when I find her with my eyes open. Gunshots off stage throughout. Hours. How were you burned? I was foolish. I tried to save two sacks of rice. Sacks of rice? We stopped a truck on the mountain pass. The driver refused to stop, so we shot out the tires. A bullet exploded the gas tank. A blue Toyota. How do you know? Mahmoud told me bandits killed the driver. What bandits? Mahmoud ordered us to stop a truck. The rice was destroyed. Pity the rice. Is a man's life worth two sacks of rice? If he just stopped and gave it to us, he'd be alive. You, he braved your Kalishnikov so the children might eat. How do you know? He worked here. His name was Alif. 
He might have had a safe and good and easy life in university, but he chose a higher road. He chose to help, not kill, people he didn't know. I was born during the Great War. At eight years old, Mahmoud gave me my own Kalishnikov. By 11, I could not count the number of men I killed. The Kalishnikov is all I know. You bastard. You mindless, remorseless bastard. Change the bandage every day. She throws gauze at him. Where is Alif buried? There was no time. Mahmoud said Alif was buried on the side of the road. Government troops have been on our heels since yesterday. We had no time to bury my brothers, let alone a stranger. Your brothers? They were martyred yesterday in Kabul. May God keep them. How martyred? Killed by government troops. Government troops? They're better trained than we thought. You fought government troops? What are they but puppets of foreign invaders? Have you seen Kabul lately? Foreign troops talking to unveiled women, restaurants selling alcohol. A strong leader is needed. What happened in Kabul? We took the palace. Then government tanks came in and took it back. It was so for my brothers. Kalim, Fazil, and Ali. Cut down as we fled, God chose to spare me, the least of Mahmoud's whelp. Fazil was the greatest horseman in all of Afghanistan. Kalim had a genius for numbers and bargaining. Ali could not read or write, but could recite every word of the Quran without error. I, the survivor, has no virtue but killing. I dread the return to our village without them. We four have four different mothers. Their wails will crack the sky. Half our clansmen perished. Many deserted and surrendered. We had to leave our dead and wounded behind. Mahmoud did not weep yet. We fled, leaving my dead brothers in the street. That man has eyes that can see a man to the bone. He sees into the secret part of me, the part of me that cannot bear another day of war after seeing Kalim, Fazil, and Ali left in the street for shopkeepers to gawk at. Better Mahmoud fell dead in, the, in that cobble street God knows I didn't mean that. Of course. Where does Mahmoud go now? Tomorrow we must make our way to the tribal territory. Why there? We have friends and allies there. But between here and there, we are out in the open, exposed to deadly fire. The only protection we have is the children. The children? What do you mean, the children? Well, government troops won't fire upon us if we are enveloped by children. Mahmoud will place children on the tops of our vehicles as we move over the mountain roads towards Pakistan. He will need you to control the children. If in that Kabul street God had written doom on Mahmoud's forehead, what would follow? Mahmoud holds his fighters together by bribes and threats. With Mahmoud gone, his fighters would melt away and return to their families. Every day you must wash the wound with clean hot water and change the bandage. Tasha Kuhl. You did me a good turn. Now, let me do one for you. Before dawn, you must run from this place. Off stage, we hear the laughter of the Afghan women. Why? Mahmoud will not leave witnesses behind. Ask me no questions. I have been disloyal enough. Enter the Afghan women. Mahmoud Khan would speak with you. Tasha Kur. Exit Omar. Mahmoud pressed us for every detail of your life. Your virtue? Your health? Your opinion of him? Of course, we pretended to know more than we knew. The man is smitten. Mortally smitten. Who cares? How are the children? Teachers busy the girls, minds with lessons. And the boys? Mahmoud recruits them into his army. He's wasting his time. You don't know your boys. <laughs> Mahmoud offered the boys a chance to fire a Kalishnikov. The boys flocked around Mahmoud like loving sons. All boys? Some boys? A, a few boys? Every last boy rushed forward for the chance to hold a Kalishnikov. Mahmoud promised a Kalishnikov to those who swear allegiance to him. That would never happen. You don't know your boys. Mahmoud failed to overthrow the government in Kabul. Now government troops come in hot pursuit. Before dawn, the wounded beast heads for the tribal territory. 
He will use the children to shield bullets from himself. Only a woman with a slapped face would believe the worst. What kind of son speaks against his father? What else but a ward on his father's face? Mahmud is a gift from God. God's gift? Massacred 50,000 innocents in Kabul? And bid his fighters toss acid in women's faces? But perhaps God's gift will make an exception in our case. Where Mahmud walks, abomination follows. That is why we must open the veins in Mahmud's neck and not rest till he is bled pale white. I did not hear that. You heard it. I do not stop a donkey that is not my own. Too bad you had no outrage for your kinsmen's murders. Malale blocks the Afghan women from leaving. You cannot make us prisoner. Where is your heart? Mahmud's tribesmen would hang us by our feet. Slit our throats like lambs at market. And leave us hanging on a tree for crows and dogs. Mahmud's army is water in his hands. The harder he grips, the more his fighters slip away. When Mahmud falls, his army will vanish. And did you hear her sing verses from the Holy Quran? Whosoever kills an innocent human being. It shall be as if he killed all mankind. And you, a doctor, a preserver of life. A surgeon's scalpel also cuts out the malignant tumor that would devour the healthy body. You have lost your mind. And found it again when Omar opened my eyes. A thousand troubles melded into one. God put us all together for a purpose far greater than ourselves. God has placed Mahmud in our hands. These children cannot defend themselves. We must remove Mahmud for the sake of the children. Our children are long dead. Then for our own sakes, we must strike before Mahmud, we must strike Mahmud before his Kalishnikovs come to purge the memory of his crimes. For our own sakes, better we cling to Mahmud. What about Afghanistan? Afghanistan is a pile of mountains. I risk nothing for a mountain. You can have them all. You can fly back to America and cook a leg of lamb in your miraculous oven. But we are stuck here. Stuck forever where Mahmud rules. The mountains are stuck here, but you have legs. The mountains would flee if they could. You were born with a man's foot on the back of your neck. You have come to love the foot and believe it's your own choice. What do you know? Mahmoud is all we've got. When the widow needs oil for her lamp, Mahmoud, Mahmoud gives. gives. When the young husband needs work, Mahmoud, Mahmoud creates, creates a job. job. When the flash flood takes out the road, Mahmoud, Mahmoud builds, builds a, a new road. road. When bandits rob merchants, Mahmoud, Mahmoud hunts, hunts them, them down and, and displays their, their heads on fence posts. posts. For empty words and promises, reach, reach your needy hand, hand to cobble. But for what you need to live, Call, Call upon Mahmud. Your stomach has no honor and will greedily accept bread from even the killer of your kinsmen. But what about your immortal part? What will you tell your husbands, brothers, fathers, sons, who look down from paradise with soul-sick disgust to see you praise their killer? They see how you answer the, their wanton murders, bowing to Mahmud. Oh, it would be an honor to serve you, my Khan. Your beloved are stomach-sick at the sight of you. Too long, Mahmud has breathed the air that was theirs. Take it back with a blade, thirsty for a bucket of Mahmud's blood. Blood does not wash out blood. As rain makes a river drop by drop, word of Mahmud's death will spread across Afghanistan like wind from the Hindu Kush. Afghans will whisper our deep, our, our deep behind their veils, behind their doors. Mother to daughter, father to son, neighbor to neighbor, mountain to mountain. Kindred spirits will be emboldened to fall upon warlords in their beds. There is a yearning for a day when one person will be as good as another, when laws, not men, will rule us. You live in another Afghanistan. An Afghanistan in the sky. An Afghanistan made of clouds. What would your men do if you had been slaughtered? Your men would act upon their ancient oath of honor. Oh, oh, code of honor. They would take no food, take no rest, spare no pain, until the last drop of the culprit's blood fell upon the ground. But what a disgrace you are to the memories of those martyrs who loved you who will only find peace in the gross effusion of Mahmud's blood. These are kitchen knives. Knives used for chopping carrots. We're not warriors. We're the mothers of warriors. You want us to act with the fire of prophets. We're not Jesuses. We're Marys. You pulled knives on me. You told me a man attacked you on the road. You spilled his blood. Was that just talk? You think it's easy to kill a man? Especially a man like Mahmud? Killing is breathing to a man like Mahmud. He's a warrior who's slain countless warriors himself. Do you think he will stand still for us? He will flail. And slash. And knock us down. And shatter us like so many clay pots. I am resolved to kill or be killed. Don't fool yourself with fine words. Talk is talk. Killing is killing. Teach me. 
Rage needs no teacher. Seeing the man before you can undo your resolve. Your hands turn to wood. Your heart to mush. Your legs to wet straw. Cheap meat never makes good soup. Malale finds a bottle of red nail polish. The Afghan women look on with schoolgirl fascination as Malale paints her fingernails red. The ogre that took away your face will enter that door at any moment. And what will your answer to him, what will be your answer to him for all the nights you lay in your servant's bed and listen to your husband pleasure his new wife? Even a kicked dog has an opinion of the foot that kicks it. But you kicked dogs slaver and fawn and roll on your backs. You kicked dogs wouldn't even think badly of your tormentor, let alone turn to bite. Malale takes Wajma's hand, applies the nail polish. What you see is unbeautiful now, but I turned some heads when I was young. My father watched me like a hawk. One night, in a terrible rage, he killed a boy peeking in at our window. The boy's father vowed revenge. My cousins and uncles vowed blood for blood, a circle of elders meant to prevent a bloodbath in the village. It was decided I was to be given to the dead boy's father to cool his anger. The night before my wedding, all the women came to our house to decorate my hands and feet with henna. How they fussed over me. When he took me, it was more like a punishment to my father than love. In my heart, I killed him a thousand times. Malale paints the hands of Galale. I saw a girl in the market in the time of the savage students. She was properly covered in the burqa, head to toe. When she reached for a pomegranate on a vendor's cart, a savage student saw her fingernails were painted red. She was beaten with a stick in public. As they held her hand on a stone, she cried for me, for help. I turned away as they cut off her fingers. In my mind, I mutilated the savage students, but it wasn't their fingers I lopped off. Malale paints the hands of Nahid. A girl of 14 was told by her father she is to marry a man of 63 who already has a wife and grown children. Every day and night, I heard the girl plead to her father's deaf ears. One day, she stopped pleading. I thought she accepted the match. She came to our house to borrow some cooking oil. She doused herself and set herself on fire. She lived for a few days in wretched agony and died a virgin. A month later, I walked by her house. I saw that her father was there, alone, sleeping. I set the house afire. He died in the flames, screaming like a child. It was my secret gift to her. Your knives remember all that was taken from you. Hark back to that hour when you were masters of your lives. Revive that hour when one cruel man was all cruel men of your lives. He twisted my hair in his cruel hand. He backhanded me and split my lip. I wet myself when he forced my legs apart. The Afghan women get caught up in the memory of the attacker they killed, sharpening their knives one upon the other, reenacting the events. I thrust the first knife into his gut. He didn't even blink. My trembling hand dropped the knife. I stuck my blade in his back. He turned and raised his Kalashnikov. But before he pulled the trigger... Planted my knife in his throat. Stuck mine between his ribs. Stabbed mine in his heart. Mine in his eye. How I relished his death cry. How his legs wobbled before he collapsed. Faced first in the dust. I wanted him to get up so, so we, we could, could do, do it, it again. again. And see his legs wobble again. And see the life in his eyes flicker again. And see his eyes go dark forever again. They don't know we have these thoughts. They think we're dumb as sheep. Docile. Timid. Grateful. Harmless. Happy. If they knew, oh my God. They'd, they'd kill, kill us all. all. I will thrust the first knife. Malele picks up a surgical scalpel. Is that your weapon? Don't be fooled by the smallness. She gets our blood up and has no weapon. She's a jinn luring us to our death. You just turned my blood to ice. Wanting Mahmoud's blood, you tempt fate. But now your weapon mocks fate. We cannot succeed. It's all jinxed, all jinxed. You're a cliff's shadow, here now, there later. Who knows where in an hour? Either Mahmoud or I shall not see the sun again. I will do the deed myself. Little mouth, big talk. Just go pull your cart like beasts of burden and die as if you never lived at all. You had your rice and tea, now go. We are not you. You're not me? You're not even you. 
Before we go, how can we repay your hospitality? Take your knives and slit your throats. Or you can wait for dawn. Mahmoud will do the same. The Afghan women begin to exit. Wait, please. If you would repay my hospitality, bring a message to the children. The day would, the day would have come when they would have had to leave the orphanage and be on their own. That day has come sooner than expected. Another volunteer will replace me in a matter of days. Find Nazir among the children. You must sit at his bedside till he falls asleep. And Ajmal, let him learn to walk on his prosthetic leg. Do not give in to his cries for help. Shaima has a heart murmur. She can have no salt in her diet. So much is left undone. Remind them to uh, wash hands, watch for butterfly minds, be joyful at lessons, resist cynicism, Lay me beside Khalida. Don't throw dirt roughly on her. Lay it on her gently like a blanket, like saying good night. Then cover us with a mound of stones to confound the wild dogs. If Mahmud would use a child to shield his body from harm, what abomination would he not be capable of? Mahmud is Mahmud. And is Malale not Malale? What do you fear in Malale? Malale fights the earth with a shovel. She battles the stones. Till her hands bleed. <clears throat> and still she digs. Malale loves all things impossible. She had a man who loved her, but chose bleeding hands. She chose good. Good that crushes a wild dog's skull with a shovel. Good that provokes lightning from a blue sky. Good that knows not when to take a step back. Good that fears God more than men. Good that blinds. What have bleeding hands changed? Children still perish. The Kalishnikov still rules. Good cannot stop the wild dogs. Good cannot stop the raging blast of the Hindu Kush. The obstinate tree faces the raging wind. The tree must bend with the wind or snap in two. Malale must be grass. Grass moves with the haughty wind. Yet grass does not perish. Conquer his hardness with your softness. Sway. Wobble. Stretch. Undulate. Let the wind howl and make havoc. Omar, where are you? Over here. Don the burqa for the sake of your children. Don't suffer Mahmoud's hand again. Maybe this time you won't get up. Malale puts on the burqa. Surrender to him, dear. That's how women win here. You can have him for a smile. Enter oh. Mahmoud, followed by Omar. All, All God's, God's blessings, blessings upon, upon Mahmoud, Mahmoud Khan. Khan. The Pashtun girls are rosy and fair. Among them are many beauties with every kind of charm, with great bright eyes, long curling lashes, and eyebrows arched and wide, with honey lips and rosy cheeks and foreheads like the moon, with tiny mouths like budding roses, and teeth even and white, their heads all clad in blackest tresses, their bodies smooth as any egg, without a trace of hair, their feet petite, with rounded heels, their haunches plump and wide. I wander like a hawk about the barren hills, many a pretty little par partridge has fallen prey to me. I could kill a man with Afghan poetry. It kills like bullets. Worse than bullets. I am recovered from bullet wounds. But from the poets, I am slain forever. Has Rumi no reply? Has Malale no reply? Is someone speaking to me? Perhaps the pot needs stirring. Your word is our pleasure, great father. May you never get tired, my Khan. May you never see poverty, my Khan. Mahmoud gives them coins. Exit the Afghan women. Make sure none of the guards is sleeping. Exit Omar. Malali. Who calls my name? Mahmoud calls your name. Can you not hear me? Neither can I see you, my Khan. Let me see what I did to your face. As you wish, my Khan. Malali removes the burqa. Mm. Thank God there is no mark on your face. May God erase any beneath the skin. Your eyes hide a terrible secret. My secret is even secreted from me. I am a diviner of men. Your eyes are as cold as death. I must be careful what I am thinking in your presence. You have extraordinary powers. 
I have not survived so many enemies because I am a fool. Confess your secret. Your dagger. The sight of it turns my blood to ice. Then let us have no cold blood between us. Mahmud hands the dagger in its sheath to Malale. You are a true man of honor. It's a beautiful thing. Why did you paint your fingernails? I always paint my fingernails. Oh, little partridge. Your own mouth gives you away to the fowler. When I first met you, I mentioned your fingernails were faded. Now they're painted. Why? To dig a grave? Do you not answer me? Why wake a man having a beautiful dream? These hands were made for love, not shovels. The hand that takes up the shovel does so for love. This mouth was made for pleasure, not annoying arguments. God created us from the same smooth, dark mud. Are you not subject to all the lures of the flesh? Be with those who mix with God as honey blends with milk, and say, anything that comes and goes rises and sets, is not what I love, else you'll be like a caravan fire left to flare itself out alone beside the road. Let me guess, Rumi. So after a long selfless day on your huge foolish Noah's Ark, after digging graves and teaching mathematics, when you lay yourself down on your straw-filled mattress, you lie with Rumi, and that's enough for you? For now. Were I a whirling dervish spewing Sufi mysticism, we'd be lying side by side. You count the dates before you even see the palm tree. <laughs> you are the Hindu Kush. Beautiful from a distance, brutal and unforgiving up close. I never met a woman like you before. How would you know? They were all ensconced in the burqa. You are ruthless, as only a woman can be playing hard to get. Don't tell me you didn't paint your nails for me. You see what you want to see. How can I see anything? Your beauty throws dust in my eyes. You're angry with me for forcing you into the burqa. But look how the burqa has improved your mood. Forgive me if I neglect to thank you. Women such as you are the cause of the burqa. Oh. My dear Malali, the fox is in trouble because of its own pelt. When I see such wild beauty, I am filled with raging jealousy by the thought that other men might gaze upon what gives my heart enchanting rapture. In you, I see the promise of paradise. Is there any wonder, then, why I must, beyond all reasons, possess that beauty for myself, protect it from all harm, preserve it, worship it till the day I die, thus the burqa? Your mind turns and turns like a water wheel, but you give me not a drop of your thoughts. Speak your mind. There was a boy fascinated by a butterfly. He tore off its wings and said, I am a lover of beauty. Your mouth is the thorn under the rose blossom. Perhaps the rose is the flaw in the thorn bush. Why do you pretend you did not paint your fingernails for me? Why do you pretend I did? Stand there, Hindu Kush. Your stony silence will not outlast my desire. It's only a matter of time before the summer sun melts the snowy mountain peaks and the little trickle becomes a raging river that sweeps all worldly cares away. Some snowy peaks never melt. The look in your eyes is more bleak than the dash de Margot. Have I no hope, Hindu Kush? Rumi says, whoever brings sweetness shall be served almond cake. Mm. Only a cruel heart would, could say that to a starving man. A starving man might go to his wives who would give him his fill of cake. Your bread is better than their cake. To my wives I, divo I say, I divorce thee, I divorce thee, I divorce thee. For you I swear off polygamy. Why did you paint your fingernails, Hindu Kush? Will you keep asking till you hear the answer that pleases you? One man broke your heart, so now all men must pay the price. To him, you were common stone. To me, the Koh-i-Noor diamond. Malali, a Khan, sleeps on an anthill. Friends are enemies, enemies friends. Those make you feel safe will kill you. Those who frighten you will keep you prepared. Sometimes one plus one equals eleven, but after you, they are two. Between now and dawn, I must live the rest of my life. 
and breathing the same air as you is the only happiness I have known for a very long time. Take the knife. Cut off the hand that slapped your face. Why do you hesitate? Surely the sight of blood is nothing to a surgeon. That's what I deserve for causing you pain. You only see the outside of me. I am a bear outside, inside. My soul is as soft and white as the feathers of the doves of Mazari Sharif. What must a man do to make amends and be worthy in your eyes? Name it. Name it and I will give you satisfaction. I wish I believed that. You will see I am a man of my word. Too often a man of his word is only a man of words. Put me to the test, Hindu Kush. Name what would make me worthy in your eyes. Leave the children behind. What are you talking about? You're running from government troops. You intend to make human shields of the children. Where did you hear that? Walls have mice and mice have ears. Mice have tongues and tongues can lie. I overheard some of your fighters. Omar. Omar. Of all the walnuts, it's the empty one that speaks. But what are sons for but to pierce a father's heart with a blunt arrow? What did he say? The question is, why are you turning my boys into fighters? Does the eagle catch flies, Malali? You gave them Kalishnikovs. They begged to go with me. They're just boys. A boy is a boy until he feels the kick of a Kalishnikov. Because they don't know they can die. Death is the playmate of Afghan children. Boys want to be men and not hide behind their mothers. A man can be a man without a Kalishnikov. Not in Afghanistan. You should be thanking me. I take these discarded souls and give them a chance to be men. I give them discipline. I teach them how to survive in a treacher treacherous world. I offer a way out of this mud coffin where they only dream of food and warmth. A boy needs mathematics only to count the bullets in, a clip, in the clip of his Kalishnikov. You know very well that a child without papers in the tribal territory has no rights. Slavers wait at the border crossings, as they have for 500 years, with ready cash to buy boys for the brick factories and opium fields. And the young girls will be sold to carpet factories that prize those nimble little fingers that can tie double knots 18 hours a day. And the, other, the older girls will be auctioned to a room of old men out to purchase a slave prostitute. And when they, get up, when they use up their youth, the girls will become domestics. When your students graduate from here, what will they do? There is no work. A carpet and a mud brick are more valuable than a head full of useless knowledge. With me, they will have a roof and food and medicine when they are sick. To remain here is to die miserably of hunger and disease. These orphans pay for their sins of their forefathers who abandoned their tribes to live in cities, to work in factories or mines or drive trucks. My children will never be orphans. They have a family, a clan, a tribe to care for them. When I fall, my children will have a thousand mothers and fathers to raise them. What will your legacy be? Haji Ghul Azrala Mahmud, traitor in human flesh? Or Haji Ghul Azrala Mahmud, protector of the young? Act with compassion and your name will shine with the radiance of the lapis lazuli of the minarets of the Musala Mosque. Haji Ghul Azrala Mahmud will reside on the highest mountain peak among the great men of Afghanistan. Greatness in Afghanistan is to stand over your enemy's corpse. Anything less is weakness. Then your claim to give me satisfaction was just a ruse. You ask for the impossible. I took you at your word. Ask for something else. For me, there is nothing else. The lion must eat. That is all you need to know. Even the highest mountain has a path to the top. Not this mountain. I prayed to God your heart would be changed. I prayed to God my heart be steadfast. God must deny one of us. May God deny the weaker. I am the weaker. As it should be. I am weak for my children. You will forget them when I make you the queen of my life. Mahmoud embraces Malale, who gently collapses against Mahmoud, laying her head on his shoulder. May God be pleased. Malale plunges the dagger into his gut. She pulls away, knife in hand, horrified by what she's done. I find your hospitality wanting, doctor. She tries to escape, but he blocks her. Do you lack the courage to kill me face to face? Do you think my death changes things? Without a man like me, a thousand devils will rise up to take my place. You will drown in rivers of Afghan blood. Rivers! 
So don't ever flatter yourself to think your painted fingernails undid Mahmoud. Mahmoud undid himself. You gave me no choice when you threatened- Your children? Your children? You used the children to hide your shameful motives. God handed you a teaspoon. Now what will you tell the world? God handed you a Greek dagger? Know this, doctor. When my corpse is given back to the earth, my headboard will read Haji Ghul Azrala Mahmud, hero in the Great War. And if there is enough of your disem dismembered and scattered corpse to commit to a grave, your headboard will read in letters written in your own blood, Malali, assassin. He takes Malale by her hair. Mahmud crumbles to the floor, taking Malale with him, choking her. She begins to lose consciousness. Trust a snake before a harlot, a harlot before a foreigner. Enter the Afghan women. With a primal, blood-chilling cry as years of pent-up rage move them to action, the Afghan women draw their knives and fall upon Mahmud one by one, reminding him of the names of their deceased men. This is for Tamur, Khalik, Nadir, Arif. This is for Ghazi, Zilmai, Fakur, Hassan. This is for Rashid, Hazikia, Samir, Shedan, Bilal. Mahmud takes up his dagger, the women surround him. Are these the women who asked for and received alms from me? Forgive me, my father, my Khan. Wajma throws down her knife. Come on! Can't you finish what you start? Mahmud! Mahmoud! After a small life, I die with blood on my hands. God's hand is swifter than lightning. Enter Omar. Who did this? Justice demanded his death. I alone wielded the knife. She lies. Kill them all. I am obliged to answer blood for blood. Now all of you, say your last prayers. Why do you apologize? Gut wound them and let me watch them suffer and bleed to death. All I ask is that you permit me to lay Khalida in her grave. Let me fall beside her. Permit her nothing. Do it. I am ready. Be sure to change your bandage every day. Do it, Omar. The code demands it. But what's the heart of Omar demand? My heart is of no consequence. You prayed. Better Mahmud fell dead in that cobble street. That was your prayer? That was no prayer. God took it for one. A man's mouth is his ruin. You cried for release, and God answered your prayer. Why do you hesitate? Give me the Kalishnikov. Omar, give me the Kalishnikov. Have you fallen to her charms? You make me drink my own bile? If you lack the heart, order the least of my fighters in here. No one of them will disobey me. Your fighters have vanished like smoke in the wind. Kinsmen, too. It was every man for himself when government troops rounded the mountain road. Who's left? I, alone. Where's Kalim, Fazil, and Ali in my hour of need? They knew iron that is not used will rust in your hands. Better I had fallen in the great war. My name would be venerated refrain of battle songs. But this disgrace, shame, the uncertain meaning of my name you tell the world I fell to a hundred assassins, treacherous enemies of my father who laid an ambush. No one must know I was undone by women. Before my invisible part quits the flesh, honor the sacred code of our tribe that binds us one to the other, or bear the shame as the son who broke the code. Is this you? Puny? Weak? Stupid, that's how Mahmud sees you. How does your veiled girl see you? Stop your ears, Thickwick. She knows the words that move men. How do you think I would so fallen? Will Omar ever see his God-given bride with a complexion of pearls? Your kin will stone you. But your bride will love and honor you. Omar will be another word for weak. You can have a new life with her. She kills with words more than their knives have killed me. This is your time to prove your love to me. I am bound by the code of honor to follow my father, even into the seven terrible hells. Mahmud will not last an hour. If his wound does not sap his life, government troops will. Follow that man and you will have lived and died for nothing. You will have never taken a bride. You will have never heard your children's voices. God spared you for a reason. You are free if you desire it. Omar, you drowned in your mother's milk. 
Will you be your father's son, or will you be the father of your own sons with the veiled girl? A sheep raised by a wolf is still a sheep. Omar cocks his rifle and aims at the women. Obey a dead man, and you forsake your veiled bride and a better life. Omar turns and aims at Mahmud. Omar. Omar shoots Mahmud. No one could tarnish Mahmud's medal in the jihad against the infidel. Let no one doubt Mahmud is honored at banquet by ancient Afghan warriors, attended by unveiled, bashful virgins, dark of eye, in green silk garments, reclining on brocade couches beside his beloved Kushal Khan Katak, drinking honeyed wine under trees that spread their shade and offer easy fruit, beside fountains gushing cold, clear water, and rivers of wine and honey. Omar begins to exit. Omar, you are welcome here. Government troops will arrest me. I will escape to the mountains. Inshallah. The young man you killed at the mountain pass, Alif. Though you destroyed his life, he will be your savior. I will vouch you work in the orphanage. Lay aside your Kalishnikov. Take up the shovel and be a leaf. Malale offers the shovel. Omar doesn't take it. What will I be without my tribe? Afghan. Omar surrenders his Kalashnikov, takes the shovel, divests himself of his war gear. Omar goes to the corpse of Mahmud, covers it with the burqa. So let us commit Mahmud's remains to the earth with all Muslim rights, and let us inscribe his headboard thus, Haji Gul Azrala Mahmud. Hero in the Great War. The Holy Quran promises those buried in blood soaked clothes shall be delivered to paradise. We can always use extra hands around here. Tasha Kor. Malale picks up Kalita's corpse. Exit Malale, followed by Omar with the shovel. Where is Mahmud's glory now? The Great War Lord is just a bag of buttons. The Great Mahmud is so much chicken feet. Glory befits God alone. Who's to say there can be no peace in Afghanistan? Who can say what is possible and what is not? What we desire does not happen. What, what God wants is done. Who can fathom God's will or works? That woman, perhaps. God has laid a heavy hand on her. She feared God, God's hand more than man's. I'd lend a hand to be nearer to God's chosen. I'd stay for rice and tea. I'd linger here to care for a child who reminded me of mine. I saw my children in each of them. Oh, give thanks for the rough road that led us to this place. And sing God's 99 beautiful names all the days of our lives. The merciful. The compassionate. The sovereign. The holy. The flawless and giver of peace. The giver of faith. The guardian. The incomparable. The compeller. The proud. The creator. The marker of perfect Harmony, the shaper of unique beauty, the forgiver, the subduer, the bestower, the provider, the opener, the knower, the constrictor, the expander, the abaser, the exalter, the honorer, the dishonorer, the all-hearing, the all-seeing, the arbiter, the just, the subtle, the aware, the forbearer, the magnificent, the concealer of faults, the rewarder of thankfulness. The highest, the great, the preserver, the maintainer, the reckoner. The majestic, the generous, the vigilant, the responder to prayer, the vast. The wise, the loving, the glorious, the resurrector. The witness, the truth, the trustee, the strong. The firm, the friend, the praised, the appraiser. The beginning, the restorer to life, the life giver. The life taker, the living. The self-existing. The resourceful. The noble. The unique. The one. The eternal. The able. The powerful. The promoter. The postponer. The first. The last. The manifest. The, the hidden. hidden. The governor. The exalted. The source of all goodness. The, the acceptor, acceptor of, of repentance. repentance. The avenger. The pardoner. The clement. The king of absolute sovereignty. The full of majesty and generosity. The equitable. The gatherer. The rich. The enricher. The protector. The, the punisher. The creator of the beneficial. The light. The guide. The originator. The everlasting. The inheritor. The right in guidance. 
the, the patient. patient. Lights fade on the Afghan women. End of play. Good work. Thank you very much. I know you worked on this very hard, and uh, we very much appreciate you doing this for us. And um, I say, wow, Bill. You know, for a guy, you do pretty good writing about women. You know, really. Pretty, pretty impressed. Lots of research. I, yeah, I'd like to talk to the people you research. <laughs> Dr. Armand would like to um, read something. and uh, he'd like to, He's written something for us, and uh, I would like to have him read this here before we begin the panel. And I'm sure it's something for us to think about. Doctor? Hello everyone. First, I would like to, first I would like to thank Mrs. Vita Palladino, Director, and Mr. Sean Noel, the Associate Director of Boston University, and other member of Boston University, who have invited me here today. In April 1978, the pro-Soviet communists plotted a coup against President Dawood and succeeded unfortunately. President Dawood and the majority of his family were killed by the communists. Soon after the coup, the resistance movement organized against the communist rule. This event initiated the three-long decade of the suffering of the Afghan people and the erosion of our civic society. The Communist Party executed and tortured thousands of Afghan students, engineers, doctors, farmers, and workers. Five million Afghans fled as refugees to Pakistan and Iran. They imprisoned and tortured many Afghans, including myself. I was imprisoned for 14 months, eight months in solitary confinement. The unstable pro-Soviet government was about to collapse, and as a result, the Soviet invaded Afghanistan. The Soviet declared a general amnesty and released the survivor from prison, including myself. However, the people of Afghanistan rushed to fight against the Soviet invader. The Afghan people fought on the front lines of a war on behalf of the entire free world. Soon after being released from prison, I escaped to Peshawar, Pakistan, and joined the Afghan re resistance groups in the society of Afghan doctors in exile. There, we established health centers in three parts of Afghanistan. We, we received help from Dr. Bob Simon from UCLA, Dr. Zikria from Columbia University, Professor Mujadidi, Dr. Hamid, and Engineer Nuri. Mr. Bill Mastro Simon produced his highly influential film, The Beast. Amidst the intensity of war between the Afghan and Soviet, he brought to light the tragedy and the atrocity of this terrible war to the world. This was a great help for the Afghanistan, since many people were unaware of our plight. One and a half million Afghan lives were sacrificed to defeat the Soviet. After that, Mujahideen resistance group came into power, and the, civic, and the civil war between the Mujahideen began. Afghanistan was divided into several zones. Each zone was controlled by a leader from a different faction. As they continued to battle against each other, some days hundreds of missiles were fired as Kabul was slowly destroyed. There was also fighting in the countryside. The neighboring countries had an influential role in this battle. 
After that, the Taliban defeated the Mujahideen and came into power. The majority of Afghanistan came under the rule of Taliban. The Taliban partially disarmed their various enemies. In this era, the situation was relatively under control, but the rule of the Taliban was harsh and unforgiving, similar to a prison, and the control in relative quiet that they established was reminiscent of a graveyard. Today, Afghanistan is in a better place than during the reign of the communist Mujahideen and Taliban. At least there is no missile fire daily, and there is some semblance of order in the cities. There are some educated people in the cabinet and parliament. The condition is relatively fair for Afghan intellectuals and businessmen. To some extent, the reconstruction of Afghanistan infrastructure is completed, especially in North. Most majority, most major roads have been built, and a few factories have established in functioning. Electricity from the Tajikistan and Uzbekistan will come in the near future. The hydroelectric dams are being repaired, and there are con contracts to excavate mines. Some people go to Afghanistan to reclaim their confiscated properties and belonging. NATO and ISOF troops have also made some contribution. The foreign troops are vital to Afghanistan because fierce fighting will resume without them and the fragile state of security will be jeopardized. If foreign troops become more aware of Afghan culture and tradition, <coughs> their relation with the Afghan people will be much improved. These were my positive impressions from the last trip to Afghanistan, from which I returned in December 2007. However, there is also a dark side to life in Afghanistan. It is important that the national army and police become organized. There is also a lack of security, such as suicide and roadside bombs and some fighting, especially in the southeast, by extremists. The roads are not safe in the southeast. Cultivation of opium, poverty, unemployment, unlivable wages, food and gas price inflammation, inflation and corruption continue to be major obstacles to progress. These problems have become further exacerbated, especially after the turmoil in Pakistan. Some beneficiary countries which export their material to Afghanistan don't want its reconstruction and the termination of war. They want exportation as a weak Afghanistan would be to their benefit. Iran's expulsion of Afghan refugees in this cold winter is another huge problem for the government of Afghanistan. Hundreds of people and thousands of their livestock have died due to the cold. Now I work with IUC, International Orphan Care. This organization has been active since 1993. The NGO was established by Engineer Nuri, an Afghan American in LA. The chairman of the board of IUC is Mayor Mike Whipple. The organization is working for the welfare of orphan and deprived children. Our mission is hope, which stands for help the orphan be productive and educated. There are almost a million children who are either motherless or fatherless. We would like to keep them off the street and away from the abuse and drugs. We provide girls and boys educational, vocational classes and recreational activities. Now we have the following courses. 
computer, basic electronic repair, embroidery, tailoring, English and literacy, as well as basketball, volleyball and ping pong teams. Also, we pro provide lunch and a small stipend. The classes aim to give them practical skill to become self-sufficient and provide for them and their family. And, and eventually help their country. The majority of our students attend the governmental school too. Instead of dormitory, we want them to live with their relatives. In a family-like environment, the pain and suffering of orphans can be exchanged for comfort and self-reliance. Our donors of OUC is Mr. Bill Mastro Simon, Mayor Whipple, and General Soli and his wife. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amman, for that uh, heartfelt um, piece explaining to us certain things that are going on and your observations from your last visit. Um, the purpose of the panel is to discuss for our voters in this presidential year, how is Afghanistan relative to this election year? How is Afghanistan tied to America in what will be decided in months to come um, from the current things of the assassination of Benazir Bhutto to uh, Iran and Afghanistan. In a sense, all these will influence our country and what do we require in the leader that we're going to elect in November who will be able to understand these complex problems in these foreign lands? And I will ask our moderator to come forth. Uh, Shahala Hariri is the director of our Women's Studies program. She's an associate professor in cultural anthropology in the College of Arts and Sciences. She just came back from Tehran. Her expertise as uh, author and filmmaker, she's conducted research in Iran, Pakistan, and India, and has written extensively on religion, law, gender dynamics in the Muslim world. Ladies and gentlemen, Shahala Hariri. Thank you. Do you want to, you want to go up there and introduce them? This was a very uh, powerful play, and I think uh, that's I thank your you. microphone there. Oh, can you all hear me? I thought I had a loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really first want to um, thank um, Director Palladino, Vita Palladino, for having organized this panel and uh, I mean this event, and to the young students who performed so ably and so beautifully, and of course to the director who just provided us with uh, this very powerful and complex and thought-provoking play. So I would now like to introduce the panelists to you and then one by one and open up to the discussions and to follow from the uh, question posed by Vita and um, open up to the floor. So um, I'm first going to invite um, the playwright, uh, Mr. William Mastro Simone to the panel, please. Um, to save time, I'm not going to be reading the very impressive CV and resume of all the panelists here because I take it that you all have this, so please uh, refer to that. Um, I would now also like to invite um, Professor um, Nick Miles from um, School of uh, Communication Journalism. Professor Tom Barfield uh, from Anthropology Department. And Professor Charles Dunbar from International Relations. And Dr. Abdullah Osman. 
All these professors have done impressive, very impressive uh, work in uh, Afghanistan, and I would now um, invite them to say a few words, or just uh, if they would like to, or um, if um, uh, anybody has a questions, or maybe the um, the young actors. Um, so I just leave it to you to please um, say something, Professor. Miles, Professor Barfield, Dunbar, or maybe the director would like to say something before we go on. Well, <clears throat> I'd like to thank Boston University for, and, and, and Vita Palladino for hosting this event and all the people who treated us so well. I'd like to thank the actors and the director for uh, tackling such a difficult piece and, and uh, making it live. Thank you. And I would also like to add my uh, appreciation of the job that Vita Palladino has done to bring this event together tonight. And <clears throat> you'll notice under the title of the play, this is all about voting here. Mm -hmm. This is a ready to vote presentation. And ready to vote refers to you and all the students at BU that Vita Palladino is trying to uh, encourage to be active in this political year. When the Afghans got a chance to vote for the first time, in a presidential election in 2004. It was one of the most thrilling moments, I think, in Afghan history. They were avid to vote. President Karzai told many stories about people who had endured great hardships and traveled many miles to vote in the Afghan elections. Uh, people who uh, broke down in tears for the gratitude, uh, tears of gratitude for the for the right to vote in an election in their own country. And we in this country take it almost, we do take it for granted far too much. Think about the Afghans and the struggle that they have had to go through in order to bring the country to a point where they can actually cast a vote in an election. And uh, I hope that the lesson of the Afghans will translate into a higher vote turnout this year and the primaries end in the, in the election. Well, one of the things I should say is that I'm very pleased that uh, Vita could present uh, Afghanistan as an election issue because of the United States' uh, many foreign policies. Uh, Afghanistan is, is the other war. It often gets forgotten. Um, the attention is on Iraq when there is attention there at all. Um, and it's forgotten that uh, the United States went into Afghanistan and to some extent was much more welcomed by the Afghan people than they ever were in Iraq. And one of the reasons for this was, as this play shows, the Afghans know what civil war, anarchy, and difficulty is. And to some extent, one of the things that they're looking for the international community, and not just the United States, but the international community, Unlike other places, Afghanistan has at least 20 or 30 countries that are participating. NATO is in charge of the military operations. But one of the things that the Civil War led Afghans to feel was that they were not in charge of their own destiny. And while they're certainly proud of their history, do feel that they can run things, one of the feelings was they could never get either their neighbors or their interior warlords off of their backs. But one of their fears is the international community has a very short interest span that'll walk off, take their lives and leave them back where they were in 30 years of war and anarchy. And to a large extent, we really owe the Afghans an attempt to put the country back together because we forgot about it once before. We armed the Afghans, we said, defeat the Russians, do it in the name of the free world. But yet when the Soviets withdrew, we told the Afghans, we don't need you anymore. We're going away. We provided no aid. We didn't negotiate a settlement. We allowed the Mujahideen to fight one another. We allowed the Taliban to rise and destroy the country. We did nothing because we said, Afghanistan will never be back there again. After 9-11, we were because it turned out that we may forget about places, but they don't forget about us. And one of the things that's really important to remember when you're going into this election that issues that seem minor, off the back burner, may be that for the time being, but they rarely remain that way. And if we don't follow through with the promises we made in Afghanistan and the world community made in Afghanistan, and it's not to fight a war there, 
but to bring peace there, to bring reconstruction, to bring education, to allow the Afghans to live ordinary lives. And their great fear, and one of the reasons the Taliban are back, is the Taliban whisper in their ear, these foreigners will go and we will be here. Be careful. We've not given the Afghans enough of a message that we're going nowhere, at least till the Afghans are capable of standing on their own feet, to live ordinary lives, not for any particular ideology, not for any economic system. Afghanistan has had the most radical communists abuse them and the most radical Islamists. They take any ideology, ours included, with a large grain of salt. But what I do think we owe them is an opportunity after 30 years of suffering to get their lives back and get what we take for granted, an everyday life where people can forget about a country because it's become a normal place again. That's what Afghans are looking for. Well, I, it's going to take a while and a lot of booms. I'm sorry. Now I guess that's, no, I haven't shut it off. I want to join everybody else, first of all, in thanking Vita Palladino for organizing this. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, Mr. Mastro Simon for writing a play that, as you can see, is a, uh, a very moving description of a very, very deep conflict that exists in Afghanistan and unfortunately, I think is exi exists in other places as well. I am pleased, uh, on one hand, that uh, Mr. Mastro Simon presents this uh, as very much a struggle between good and evil. And I think that is, is certainly, certainly right. And I do want to say the reason to be interested in Afghanistan is that this conflict, I think is really central to the struggle uh, that the present administration refers to as the long war. I think I would refer to it more as the long struggle. And what we want to do is make it not be a war, but to be a struggle. The one point I want to make that I think, um, I hope Mr. Mastro Simone would agree, is uh, Mahmoud expressed stereotypically the concerns that people in Afghanistan feel. Uh, Professor Barfield referred to it just now as uh, these are the Westerners who have betrayed you in the past and will continue to do so. I do want to say that that message is a very, very powerful one and one that moves a lot of people, the message, the, the, the dark side message, Mahmoud's message, uh, and I do want to say I should have congratulated all the actors, and I, I particularly, I, th I think that Mahmoud, uh, you may not have attended, intended this, but I think he had the best lines. And they were, uh, excuse me for uh, uh, singling someone out as uh, inter pares. I won't put the primus on it, but to say that uh, you, you expressed them very well. Um, what I think I'd like to say is that this is not a message to be taken lightly as something that's evil, that's what we're fighting against. It's terribly important to put yourselves in the skins of the Afghans and of the Palestinians and of the Iraqis, to name uh, three peoples that are under great stress and to try at least to understand what motivates them, to believe that what we refer to as terrorism is something that has virtue in it, and to see the desperation that causes people to blow themselves up, uh, to see that as the, the expression, the best expression, the best thing that they can do in their lives. And I think one of the most depressing things about Afghanistan is the fact that suicide, when I lived there, and it was a long time ago, uh, <clears throat> I guess um, many of you in this room were not born when I left Afghanistan in 1985. Yes, I 
there would be a number that wouldn't. I think there are some sitting in front of me here that would be among those. Um, uh, sorry, I, I also got the date wrong. It was 1983, so that's more of you that are included. Uh, suicide was something that was haram, that was something you did not do under whatever circumstances. An Afghan mujahid had no thought of killing himself. He, an Afghan mujahid was very much like an American Minuteman, and I say this with great respect, that it was far better to get down behind the wall and drop one of your enemies at a distance than it was to uh, have the frontal assault. But the idea of a frontal assault that ended in your blowing yourself up was something that was inconceivable to Afghans in my judgment. I ask others who have spent time there to confirm this as well. So I end on a, uh, there, there, was, there was a lot of, of darkness in that play. And I end, I guess, asking you to hear, to listen, to try to penetrate that darkness and to understand it so that it can be dealt with and managed and that souls and whole groups of people can see that there is a better life ahead than strapping on a belt and going and blowing somebody up in Kabul. Thank you. Dr. Osman, would you like to make? Uh, first, I thank the Boston University to inviting me. Uh, I think if foreign troops withdraw from Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan will be a breeding place for the terrorism and extremism, and wo civil war will start, and the war will spread in the region, and it will be dangerous for all the world. I, I think uh, I'd like to come back to the question posed by um, Ita Palladino, that is to say, what kind of leader do we want to send to the White House, and how serious should we take our uh, civic responsibility in this very important, I mean, very interconnected world? We are, we are all, in, all uh, connected, and, and we really have to pay attention to whom do we vote for, take that very seriously, and, and challenge our leaders to respond to um, the events that some of which have been created by our leaders in this part of the world. So it is important to ask these questions and to, to, to take actions and to act as responsible um, citizens of this great country. So I would like to see whether there are any more Quest, uh, comments that the panelists would like to make, or any questions that any one of you may have, or the actors may have, a contemplate. There's been a lot of care directed in this direction, and it would be nice to have some. <laughs> yes, back the may, other way. Uh, any, any questions? Yes. My sense is that Afghanistan gets very little play in the presidential debate or in any of the individual debates, that the economy has taken over first place, followed by Iraq, and oh yeah, of course we've got to keep in Af stay in Afghanistan, but it doesn't get very much attention from the candidates, and it's hard to tell uh, where they stand or what they might do about Afghanistan from what they have said on the campaign trail. They haven't really said much but we would hope that they would see it through to the end this time, and who, who knows when the end will be, but we cannot abandon Afghanistan again and leave it to the kind of fate that it suffered at the hands of the Taliban as a breeding ground for international, for global terrorism. Professor Buffett? Oh, sorry, Professor Buffett, did you want to make some comment? Yes. 
Professor Mills from Journalism said is that what we did for the flyer that we generated through the university was that over a period of time I just kept cutting my articles from the New York Times mostly on Afghanistan and it became, if you take a step back from what you're reading, I know, you know, it's harder when you read it online probably than when you read it in the old fashioned newspapers, but I just started to cut out headlines and I had Chris to make your flyer cut out all the headlines how only recently, last week, there were tourists killed in Afghanistan. And our government quietly talks about, well, are we gonna, you know, the military has said to the administration, we need more troops in Afghanistan. And some of our candidates fluidly talk about military. There is one that I can think of that uses the word diplomacy. And diplomacy is somewhat of a foreign word, I think, in America, and is much more used across the ocean. Because there are so many countries that live in a concentrated area. America is so big, it's 3,200 miles wide, and it's all one country. We don't really, I mean, how many people get articles on Canada or Mexico? And they're part of North America. So a lot of this is that the press is covering um, what they want to cover, and a lot of it is about money. But um, don't be fooled. The stories are there, but they kind of get buried. But if you just start cutting headlines and putting them in groups, you'll start to see how these issues really are there and that they just are minimized. But certainly we must talk about the interrelationship between Pakistan, Iran, and Afghanistan as well, and how this is all related, and Iraq, it's all related, because these are the same groups are traveling in different places in those countries, so. Well, I also want to add to that, that it's very important not to allow our um, very capable leaders to displace uh, issues and to take our attentions away from what is important and to lead us into something that really should not um, be the focus of our attention right now. I mean, the attention, of course, I'm from Iran and I feel the pressure there, but I don't think that is where the um, focus should be. Afghanistan, you know, attention we have to pay to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Palestine. Palestine is a very, very important issue. Nobody addresses the Palestine. Think what's happening in Gaza right now. Um, these are very important issues that bear directly on our lives and well-being in this part of the world, and it is up to us to think about these issues and to have, to want our leaders to respond, our Mahmouds of the world, shall we say, to respond to these questions. So I think, you know, I'd, I'd like to, to elaborate, I mean, follow up on what um, Vita Paladino said. Yes. For me as a voter, or I as a voter, can really assess what um, candidates are going to be doing, even if they're not talking about it. But I consider myself fairly well read, and I still don't know what's going on. As we, you know, I still don't have a sense of what the status quo is in Afghanistan. What exactly is happening with our policy there? What exactly is happening with our military there on a regular basis, on a daily basis? Um, and that's kind of what my general question is to all of you, is what is going on there? And Yeah, I will leave uh, the, these two men to my right and the man to my left to what some people call Bintus. They have been to Afghanistan recently. And so I will leave the, um, the point about the actual situation on the ground to them. I will say to any of you, and this is a message I'd really like to get across. And I say this with some trepidation. If you send me an email at with the address is CF, as in Foxtrot, Dunbar, it's on the program, the rest of it, at bu.edu, I'll send you some stuff. Uh, particularly, I'll send you a website that you can subscribe to. I'm sorry to say this to you. You said, and we all lead busy lives. I think it would be smart to become literate on the Afghanistan struggle, and it is, a, and it, I must say, it's a, it's a larger struggle than just Afghanistan. It's the package of Afghanistan and Pakistan that are involved. I will send you a, a recent article, I hope, I think I can still, 
dredge it up in what I call my files somewhere, and it's not very long. I'll also give you a website which will give you more news than you ever want to have about Afghanistan every day on your screen. You can filter it. Uh, you're all clever geeks and, and can manage that. <laughs> but to make a, a larger point, it is simply that we as Americans now need to pay attention and need to understand what this struggle is about. And it's a very, very important struggle. I think that's one point I'd like to make. The second point, with respect to the candidates, um, I cannot think of any candidate who is likely to get elected president who is not going to take Afghanistan seriously. I think that's the good news. I think that, there, that these are, are people who are literate in our foreign affairs for the most part. Um, I guess Mr. Huckabee could possibly be not be included in that category, and I guess he probably still has some chance to, uh, to succeed. Uh, I don't think he is well versed in foreign affairs. If he ever gets close to, to um, being that way, he will learn. He is not uh, an, an, an intelligent man. But that is the good news, and I think a further piece of good news is that uh, the West is in this with us. Uh, the Europeans, while there is some flagging of resolve, uh, are, um, are there, the Canadians are there, and important to remember that by the size of their populations, a couple of the countries, Canada and Netherlands, the Netherlands are ones that spring to mind immediately, are taking large casualties uh, as a proportion of their, of their population. Uh, I would just guess probably more than we are in the United States, in, in Iraq and in um, Afghanistan. Um, so the Europeans are there as well. But the point is, uh, and, and I don't think you're going to be able to do very much as, as voters. Sure, if you get a chance to ask a candidate, what will you do about Afghanistan, you will get some boilerplate. And the, it'll be good boilerplate. It'll be something that you'll, you'll be happy to hear. Another point, the struggle that they are going to have is being sure that the amount of resources get devoted to Afghanistan and to know that this is part of the long struggle. Part of it is military and that there is a, a sense that we will support the troops. The much more difficult part of it is the non-military side of the struggle. And it is there that, um, that uh, the purse strings may tighten and they should not. When you see that beginning to happen at some point, consider an email to your, um, to your representative and your senator about Afghanistan. So those are just an, another couple of thoughts that I have. Uh, one of the things is there's much more consensus about Afghanistan than there is Iraq. And in some ways, this actually resembles during the Soviet period when Democrats were opposed to Reagan's adventures in Central America against the Contras. And the one way that they proved that they weren't soft was they saying, well, we give money to Afghanistan, don't we? And we've got a similar kind of thing here. The faster Democrats want to pull out of Iraq, the more they justify that by saying that's because we could use the troops better in Afghanistan. Now, whether they mean that or not is a whole other thing. But um, they're two very different wars, and they have two very different constituencies. And so uh, for that reason alone, uh, remember that foreigners don't vote in American elections. Uh, many Europeans note that they, they really should have at least a few electoral votes, you know, because they have to live with the consequences. A lot of the world thinks that way. Uh, but in fact, our view of foreign affairs is very much like that New Yorker cartoon of New York and all the way out to California with a little flag sitting there and nothing in between. Unless, unless a foreign affairs group has a strong ethnic constituency in the United States, it doesn't appear on our radar. We have problems with Azerbaijan because of Armenians. We have Greeks and we have Turks. We have Jews in Israel and Palestine. We have Cubans. Anytime there's an American ethnic group, they ask the questions. We have Afghans, but they're not well organized or very many politically to make that an issue. So we've always got to remember that unfortunately in our politics that very often local groups, Americans, 
for whom a particular foreign issue is important, that sets the agenda for our own politicians, for, for better and worse. And that's just the way our system works. But fortunately for the Afghans, there is still a very large reservoir of support. As Ambassador Dunbar was saying, the Canadians have taken that 84 Canadians have been killed past year in southern Afghanistan. Uh, and there's a huge debate going on in Canada. Why should we be in Afghanistan? But they're there, and they say they're going to stay there. You know, that's, a, that's not a question of, of American politics. The Dutch didn't go to the north like the Germans did, where there's not much fighting. They are in the place where Umumula Omar is from, and Aruz gone, and are fighting. And a friend of mine who's a Dutch anthropologist, but also in the Dutch military in the reserve, has said, what did you guys, pick the wrong place? That's not a very safe place to go. <laughs> and he said, you have to remember, the Dutch allowed a massacre in Srebrenica. They stood, behind, they stood bes beside as Serbs wiped out Muslims. That's a trauma for the Dutch military. And he said, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is show we're a real army and that that was an aberration. We, we, we deliberately picked a hard place. So, you know, these are types of things that we don't, we don't consider. There's all kinds of reasons that countries have to be supporting in Afghanistan. The bombers that, that blew up people in London were trained along the border with Afghanistan. It's not just us that feels the effect of this. And the recent assassination in Pakistan has shown us this is not just an Afghanistan problem. This is a regional problem. And surprisingly, it actually may be easier to get a handle on the situation in Afghanistan than it is in Pakistan. As hard as that seems, Afghanistan is not likely to fall apart into little pieces. I'm not so sure about Pakistan. But after 30 years of civil war, <laughs> if Afghanistan hasn't fallen apart with no government, nothing's going to break it. <laughs> I do want to just make one quick comment. I went out. Uh, uh, one uh, quick comment about the Dutch at Srebrenica. I don't think I can, I, I'm not Dutch, I, uh, but I can't let the point pass that the Dutch, uh, that it seemed that the Dutch be uh, viewed as cowards uh, in Srebrenica. They were an army that followed orders. The orders came from much higher up in their United Nations command structure. Uh, they, were, uh, they were helpless. I suspect if there had been, having said that, some possibility that a, um, a Dutch officer might have disregarded his orders. But that's a very hard thing to do in an organized military. And I just wanted to yes. make that point. They all they always say it takes a generation for for d democracy to actually become a part of a culture or for the different ways of thought to actually take place. So do you all have you observed over the years as things have gotten better or has or as progress has taken place in the country, are there Afghanistan or Afghani uh, Thomas Jeffersons or Afghani um, representatives who are who are fighting the democratic battle or fighting the, the battle for change? on the, the political front that are, and who are they, and are they trying to make those changes? Are we still yet to see those real, the Federalists for the Afghanis? Well, one thing that I'm, I might say on this is, for those of us who have followed it for a long time, it's an easy country to follow because we've seen the same names for the past 30 years. <laughs> they get recycled, the communists are back in parliament, but you recognize the names. I thought they were killed. No, they're back. <laughs> Everybody gets recycled. And that's actually one of the problems in Afghanistan. We're having people that have been fighting each other with the same ideologies for the past 30 years, oblivious of the fact that after 30 years, now the vast majority of, of Afghans are under 25. It's a fast-growing population. And when you talk to young Afghans, they said, when are these guys going to leave the stage? All of them. The guys that say, we won the war against the Soviets, all hail the Mujahideen. The communists who say, by God, if we'd only had a chance, we would have fixed this country up. And even those that talk about 
politics but don't do anything. These are people at the local level that are forming civil society organizations, that are going to universities and other things. And I think if ever given a chance, if we finally see essentially a log jam break and these, this old order, which has been sitting on Afghanistan for the past 30 years, it break and we see faces that I don't recognize, whose names I don't know, who I've never heard of. That's where I think the future of Afghanistan is because those people have ideals for the future. Those are people who say, let the past go. Let's move this country forward. And they have optimism. We realize things have gone on so long. Most of these kids were born after the Soviets left. Even talking about the Soviet war to them is before they were born. And we have not allowed politics to work out that way because we're more comfortable with the people we know. So those are the people that still hold office. Yeah. These are people that have been around for a long time, and we've given no access to a new generation mm -hmm. to come into parliament, to come into government, to run provinces. It's the same old guys that everybody knows, and they have, unfortunately, pretty bad track records, most of them. Uh, maybe just I just want to make Could a comment, uh, since you invoked the play, which we have to pay attention to that. Maybe, given the change, if it ever comes about, there would be some women who will bring about um, uh, some democratic changes. Um, yeah. Yes. Could I, uh, may I just make one quick comment on that? Uh, the, the struggle portrayed uh, by, in the play by Mr. Mastro Simon is one that has gone on. This was actually what I wrote in notes that I made to come up here, but I forgot the notebook, but fortunately I can, it's only been about 15 minutes so I can still remember. Um, the, um, that this struggle, this, these two Afghanistans have existed for a long time. I mean, I think it's possible at least to go back to when the, uh, when the in modern Afghanistan, to go back into the 1920s when you, you began to get these modern cities and the, the, the beautiful description uh, that, that is uh, said by Malalai um, about what Chicken Street was like. Incidentally, Chicken Street is what the foreigners called that area. Uh, we know it as Chorai Torabaz Khan. Torabaz Khan Crossroads is the area that is generally being talked about. That was one Afghanistan. And then there was the other Afghanistan that much more reflected in a, in a non-militant way some of the views that Mahmoud was putting out. That's been a, a schism in the country for a very long time, and it still exists. The apple cart was upset. Uh, forgive me, sir, I don't know what your politics are, in my opinion. Uh, it, um, the apple cart was upset, in my opinion. Um, when Daoud Khan overthrew the king, the monarchy, which had existed. It was kind of downhill ever since then. Uh, uh, and um, now the two are mixing together and not liking each other very much. It's going to be a long evolutionary process, but it's very tough to deal with some of the, um, some of the traditional views that there are in the countryside, and I must say, in, in my opinion, more in the south and east of Afghanistan than, uh, of course, in Kabul, Herat, and then north of the Hindu Kush, of the, that the cold winds kept blowing off. <clears throat> but the play, <clears throat> on the one hand, is about the plight of women, but on a deeper level, for me, the Afghan women in this play are really the Afghan people and they're struggling between the future and the past. And in this play, the past is murdered, which is, makes this play uh, filter through the uh, artistic prism, in my mind, a wish fulfillment for Afghanistan to kill the past and move into the future. But when I was there, I was there in 81 during the war, and then I went back in 2004 it was my impression that the Afghans are ambivalent, as they should be, about the past and the future. In the play, the women say, yeah, we know he's a monster, but he provides jobs. And about Malalai, 
on the one hand, she could be a nightmare looking at her. She's a nightmare to them at, at moments. And at other times, I would like to be like her. I would like to be free. I would like to be, think like her. And so I see this, this struggle in the play that all the comments these gentlemen are making, I'm trying to translate into an artistic form, put it on stage. Yes. You did it very well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, for me, one of the most powerful elements in the play is that struggle that is embodied by the characters between idealism and basic functioning. You know, you're desecrating mm -hmm. a graveyard, but that's how we eat. That's sort of that, like, how do you move forward in the midst of that kind of chaos? And that then, like in the end of the play, the, the only redemption comes when people just have to relate as people. You know, it's like Marlai and Omar have this moment of like just healing literal wounds, and then they sort of see each other as humans instead of as like archetypes or foes on either side of a line. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very uh, terrific comment, in my opinion. Anyway, okay, this is my question. <laughs> so, it's wonderful, it's wonderful to have that expressed in a dramatic form, and, I don't know, thoughts about how to sort of make that happen in the real world? <laughs> very, very carefully. I think you hear uh, Afghanistan spoken of most frequently in military terms. Mm -hmm. We got to throw more troops at the problem, but that's really not the answer. Uh, as uh, Dr. Osman was pointing out, there it, there is progress being made in rebuilding the hydroelectric dams and restoring power, in building <coughs> building roads and building schools, but it's lagging way behind the expectations, the hopes, and dreams that the Afghans had when first the Taliban were ousted. There was an absolute explosion of joy in Afghanistan when the Taliban were chased out. When I got to Kabul in 2004, there was music and dancing in the streets and the bazaars were full of people and there were wedding halls being built. Uh, you know, it seemed like every day a new wedding hall would spring up where Afghans spend their life savings and more uh, getting married to a... Uh, the other thing that I noticed, between 2004 and 2005, there were many fewer women wearing the burqa in 2005. There was a great difference in a year. And I haven't been back since December 2005, but I don't know if that trend has continued or if they have been cowed by the recent attacks and the suicide bombings in, in Kabul. I don't know. Yeah. And I'd like to hear his thoughts on that. But the, the solution is not simply military. The Afghans were very, very optimistic. Uh, after the Taliban were ousted, there was great support for the invasion that toppled them. And ever since then, their hopes have been steadily diminishing as the pace of reconstruction of the infrastructure that they need to, to live by, live with, uh, just hasn't, hasn't come around as nearly as fast as was hoped. And I think that's something that we have to pay much, much more attention to in Afghanistan is rebuilding the infrastructure, giving people the opportunity to make a living. As soon as they can get a, a job that, that allows them to support their family with some degree of dignity, that's, that means more than anything else. The other note of optimism is uh, you, you have uh, something in common with the young Afghans, is that they're on cell phones 24 hours a day. And I think the cell phone <laughs> and the internet are a couple of things that are going to open doors in Afghanistan, uh, especially as Tom said, this, uh, the younger generation dominates the population of the country now. And these are the guys who are uh, talking on cell phones and surfing the web. Uh, I also would like to say I was in Afghanistan in the summer of 2006, and I basically was working with young um, college students. I was in the university and I met a lot of young women. And I have to say, not very many of them were wearing the burqa, of course, in the university, but outside, there was a different matter. They seemed to be like these women, you know, very determined. They were interested in um, pursuing their education. I mean, the idea was to start a 
uh, Gender Studies Institute in, in, the, in the Kabul University. And the amazing thing, the most amazing thing was that not only this idea of Gender Institute was very well liked and well received among the women, students, and professors, but also the male faculty. I mean, there, were, there was not a single person who didn't think it was necessary to have that. And I think that's why it is so important to see how these ideas are being negotiated, you know, eventually reaching certain common grounds and hopefully creating a, a better society if, of course, other factors can be uh, controlled and, and, and managed. So I think it is really very um, significant, important to see how these women, I, I interviewed the Minister of um, Health or Women's Affairs, Masouda Jalal, Dr. Masouda Jalal. She was such an impressive woman. I mean, very determined, you know, and she told me about 30 years you know, before this whole event, women did not wear the chador, women did not wear the burqa, women were in the universities, women were in various government positions. And every time you see them in government positions, you see such self-confident women, you know? I mean, they know what, what, what they're there for and what they're doing. I just want to say one, I want to inject one thing about your remark as well. Um, when I talked to Bill uh, and I, yeah, received the play and I read it and I go, hmm, do I put it on the enrichment program or the ready to vote program? So I just want to take it out of uh, nonfiction and get a fiction moment. Uh, let's turn it into the arts and what the arts have done for us tonight. Um, you know, the word is what started activism in this country, it was the beat poets, it was the lyricists, it was people like Bob Dylan, and it was the folk songs. It's the word. And I want to say this is what pays tribute to Bill. He, he's, he writes pieces that are serious, that have serious content, and he turns it into art, and dramatic art. And the words that were used really reflect to us the heart, the passion, the issues that we're talking about. But I want, don't want to forget the fact that it is art that also allowed us to reflect and that art reflects to us these things that are important in our lives. So I want to pay tribute to a playwright who did this. Thank you. Actually, if you look at South Asia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and India, they've all had, before the United States, women leaders. That region, it's so. You guys finally got around to it? Um, Great Britain had Margaret Thatcher, and nobody thought that lady was a pushover. So um, I don't think this will be a, a problem at all, because actually, um, Afghans have, have had to deal with this conservative Afghans very often. What category do you put people in like that? And you always have to remember they don't necessarily put, they understand that people don't necessarily fit into their categories. Foreign women are often perceived that they can travel in male roles. They're, they are perceived that way. Um, they, wouldn't necessarily, they wouldn't necessarily approve of that in an Afghan woman, but that's, you know, they're not dealing with one. So, but the other thing, too, is, is that Afghanistan has always had a tradition of powerful women. Uh, they haven't always been public. Um, but there was a joke made in terms of overthrowing the king. Uh, it was the Mohammed Zai dynasty. It was said if the Mohammed Zai women had been in charge instead of the Mohammed Zai men, they never would have been overthrown because <laughs> they were perceived of as much tougher than them. And that was a, a stereotypical joke that was made about that, that dynasty. Um, and if you go back, and, and, and even the, the, the heroine of our, our saga tonight, Malalai, 
the story on, on, on that is that's a woman when the Pashtun troops were retreating, she threw down her veil and says, do we have any men here? You know, and she shamed him into fighting. This was very, and this is, this is many sexist societies, this, the fact you have, uh, you know, sex segregation does not mean that one sex is completely dominant. It was Spartan women that had the famous uh, uh, aphorism, come back carrying your shield or on it. <laughs> okay, and it's, this, this, is, this is true in, in, in many societies, is, is that this whole honor complex and everything, uh, it's interactive. Uh, but if they're dealing with somebody like Hillary Clinton, Margaret Thatcher, or anybody else, uh, you're representing, it's your position that you're representing. And the gender has very little to do with it. We're not dealing with individual relationships here. We're dealing with state-to-state -state relationships. And people, after all, when the Afghans were fighting against the British, Queen Victoria was ruling. And she ruled for a very long time, too. So uh, this, is, this is not alien to them. It might be new to us. But, but not to them. <laughs> yes. Um, one thing that was I was thinking a lot about during the reading of the play was sort of this um, the importance of tradition in the culture and um, sort of the knowing of the ancestors and the way that they live their lives. And I feel like in American culture, a lot of the time we're lacking a sense of this cultural identity um, because we are such a new country and because we are so isolated at times. And I just found myself wondering about sort of um, the tension between progress and tradition and what that means for um, in Afghanistan and like moving forward with politics and the different, and like the, the mention of the artifacts and all of, all of these things. <laughs> so you're wondering between the tension between the progress and tradition, is that? Yeah, uh, I, I just, I mean, I don't, <coughs> I, I, it's just a thought, I, mean, I just wanted to know. Uh, you, you want to take your after? Positives and negatives on each of those. Our lack of tradition, we empower the individual. You can be whatever you want to be, regardless of what your family is, what your family thinks, what your background is. At least potentially you can do that. That's, that is incredibly attractive to individuals, but that's like acid against a strong social structure. It breaks it down. You lose community values. You lose essential history. But it's wonderful for the individual. And many young Afghans think that's the greatest thing that we're offering is not democracy. It's empowering the individual, not giving out power by groups or by villages or by coming to a consensus. But individual rights, not consensus. But at the same time, that's, that's radically disruptive. <clears throat> and it can be also a real problem. You lose a lot when you do that, too. You know, that when you have community, you can never be isolated. Somebody's always going to take care of you. They're your people. Uh, so this goes back and forth. But this is something, this is something that, that even, it's, it's not even just us. The Arab social historian Ibn Khaldun in the 14th century said, you know, when Bedouins move to the city, they lose their sense of tribal solidarity because in the city, all you need is money. You don't need kinship. Money buys you friends. Money buys you food. In the desert, money buys you nothing. It's only solidarity. So this is something, you know, this is hardly new, but it's two entirely different social systems, and it's what Ambassador Dunbar was saying. You move to the city, that empowers individuals. That makes their relatives in the countryside a little bit upset. We sent you to the city so you'd help out the group, and now you're forgetting their roots. And this, of course, is well known in this country. If you come from a place that's very strong social ties, it can be seen as training to be a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever, is maybe you'll go on your own. Maybe you'll forget about the group. And in Afghanistan, where the group is so much more important, this is still a live political issue. For us, it isn't. But you have to remember that, that, that empowering the individual is incredibly attractive <coughs> to individuals. Hmm. Yeah. You know? And I just add to that one other dimension of it is the progress, the tie that Mahmoud spoke of with such contempt. 
it's all the West. And that's why it's very difficult, I think, for Westerners to, to support and, and to be there in a way that doesn't look as if they're just, that they're disrespectful of these traditions, which are very important to many, many Afghans. Um, I can't explain it because obviously I'm on the side, I, you know, I've been, been hardwired to be on the side of, quote, progress, unquote, as we saw described in the, in the, in the play. But I know at the same time that there's that resistance. Who the hell is he? He comes to this country, at least in my case, I can speak one of the languages fluently, but doesn't know anything. It's like he's from Mars, and he's telling us how to organize this society, and he's putting on a tie and going to Kabul and thinking great thoughts, but he doesn't understand what's going on. It's something you have to be very careful about, in my opinion. I also think the tension was to be seen, again, coming back to the artist and to the play, is between what uh, Malalai represented and what the other women did. Malalai was more of an individual and different. So that difference had its attractions to the point that the, uh, you know, Mahmoud became fascinated and also frightened by her. But the other women represented more of tension. In, in all cultures, you always have the individuals that may assert herself or himself and the kinship and the group that tries to pull him or her back to the community. So it's always this tension going on, but sometimes one gets more you know, power or push or coming to cities may, may give one greater um, individual freedom you know, versus being back in the community. So it's always this tension between um, uh, falling back on the tradition or wanting to push for something different and modern. You know, if Malalai were to do what she wanted to do, she would have been disastrous at some point. You know, even looking at this play, you know, she had to put the borga in order to be able to get her wish going. So I think you really have to understand this sort of dynamics, this tension between what the individual wants, what the community demands. I'm wondering whether uh, Dr. Osman would want to make any comments about the tradition and, and uh, uh, progress or traditions and modernity and change. But, uh, tradition in Afghanistan, they are the main, they have the power. And they usually, uh, they obey by women, especially in the countryside. Uh, their culture and custom is like this. But in cities it is different. Uh, because uh, the woman and men has uh, equal, especially in capital. One of the things that's happening in Afghanistan that started happening as soon as uh, the Taliban were out is that Afghans who had fled to other parts of the world during the days of... Uh, the refugee camps, and then later in the days of the civil wars, started to come back to Afghanistan. And now here's a whole generation of Afghans who have been raised outside of the country, who are coming in with different ideas. I think some of those people are going to make a difference in Afghanistan's future as well. They are looked on with some disdain by the Afghans who said, well, I stayed through the whole thing and you left and for a soft life in the West, you know, you're not uh, come back here and tell us how to run Afghanistan. But they are coming back. A lot of them have come back, and they are participating in whatever is going to be the new Afghanistan. But it has been, has been pointed out, it'll take at least a generation, maybe two, to make significant changes and to rebuild Afghanistan, uh, not only just rebuild it, but to build it, build on top of what they, uh, what they had before to make it into a bona fide, full-fledged, self-sustaining member of the world of, uh, of nations. Um, is there one more? Okay, we'll take one last question and we really have to call it off. Sorry, can you speak louder? Five Western European countries, you have countries like 
Costa Rica, and say you're talking for sight. I mean, what about the great powers of Russia and China? You can't come to a consensus with them in this region. What, 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 are you, what would you suggest about this? It's a very fair comment. Thank you for, for making it. Um, I do want to try to understand anybody is welcome to join in this uh, and to participate in helping the Afghans to rebuild their, their society. Unfortunately, and I do include, I, I of course would include Japan in the, um, in the uh, among Western countries that are trying to do that. You mentioned Costa Rica. Did, were you saying that Costa Rica is involved in, sorry? I didn't say I didn't say thirty. You did. Well, there's about thirty. I know there's about. 30. Okay. Yeah, I guess the question I would raise is, what are the, what are the Russians up? No, I'm suggesting anybody is welcome to help the Afghans. I'm sorry that I said West. You have, um, you have um, uh, found a chink in my armor, and um, you have used it well. I, uh, it seems to me, though, that if you looked at who is uh, spending serious money in trying to do this assistance, it would be fairly heavily Western. I hope I'm wrong about that, and perhaps you know that I am. But I think anybody is most willing to, uh, most uh, uh, if they want to help, help. And I think the, the, the United Nations mission in Afghanistan certainly has more people in it than just Westerners. So I guess I, I stand corrected, whoever, and I appreciate you doing it, whoever is, uh, wants to be helpful, uh, they are uh, welcome, as I said in another part of the of, uh, people who write from right to left, Athan was Athan to all of them. They are, they are welcome to come and, I, I think, support. There but has been, there has been. They are not good relation with Russians. It is difficult that Russian troops come back to Afghanistan and help, I think. Recently, within the, the past month, there has been a change. It, by and large, it is Western. I mean, if you look at, at the ISAF forces, now that includes Eastern Europe, the Ukrainians, the Lithuanians, they're people who used to be part of the Soviet Union that are, that are part of, of the NATO and the ISAF forces there. And I would put the Latin American countries under Western. Um, but, for example, we don't have a large number of Indian troops. I would suggest that they be invited. Um, not very popular with Pakistan. But the biggest change is, is something that we tend to neglect by looking at the military. Uh, last month, China signed an agreement with Afghanistan to invest $3 billion on a copper mine. $3 billion is pretty much the GDP of Afghanistan. They will build that. That means they've got to build a railroad to the ocean to get that out as part of that. They also said as long as they were there, they put up an electric line that would electrify Kabul. That's something that we tend to forget about. We're focusing on what we can do in terms of fixing this road or that. The Chinese are investing all over Africa, all over Asia. Afghanistan has tremendous undeveloped mineral resources, and China has the money and interest to do it and to lay down. And they beat Western companies in the, uh, the bidding for this um, to essentially say, we're going to invest $3 billion in Afghanistan. There's no Western country that's willing to put up that kind of money. China is willing to take, as sort of a state-sponsored economy, much greater risk to get its resources than the Western countries are. And if that really comes into being, if we see a $3 billion investment come into being, that's going to radically transform Afghanistan's economy in ways that we can't really imagine. Uh, and yet that just came as a bolt out of the blue. And even the Afghans are not. Sure. I mean, they don't even have the ability that that could be highly detrimental ecologically and other things. But uh, the fact is that somebody stepped in with more money in terms of, of a major capital investment than all the West combined has been willing to put up with, you know, with, with their aid. Uh, we'll give the last word to uh, Mr. Mr. Simeone. Simeone, please. A brief word. <clears throat> um, some years ago, President Clinton apologized for not acting in Rwanda. 
Uh, I hope Afghanistan won't be apologized for. I hope that people won't forget our commitment there and that a lot of people do look up to us. When I was there, I was very proud to see uh, one day I was at an orphanage and some American soldiers came in with uh, school supplies. Um, out on the roads, I saw them building a school uh, uh, for girls. Uh, there were a lot of great things being done. And uh, it made me very proud, and I just hope that uh, whoever bring it back to politics will be mindful that there are countries that do look up to us and that um, we can be a force for good in the world. And I think Afghanistan proves that. Um, would you like to make some comments? I, just, I want to thank our panel. I hope you're impressed with our professors, and I, I certainly am. You didn't know they were hidden in these holes. And I want you to be impressed, of course, with our playwright, Bill Master Simone, because you might be doing his work sometime, and you might be going to his plays. And I want to just thank uh, Dr. Of Monk to come, that he came all the way to send this message and that he is so committed to um, healing his country after witnessing all this sorrow and that he will not relent and that he will continue his work in the orphanages <laughs> and that we will we want to raise money for those orphanages as well and that's also part of the healing process and I think to tack on to something that uh, Bill said is that we also don't hear in our press the good things that our soldiers do do in orphanages and building schools, even in the NATO forces in Bosnia, um, in, that we just don't hear about these good stories for the work that we do do. That's the irony. But I want to thank everybody for coming and thinking and analyzing what's the best thing to do. And we want Bill to continue to write about serious subjects to make us think. You have to get a little reflection of a burst of creativity now. And thank you very much for helping us out, all of you. Thank you. <laughs>